Okay, well, welcome back everybody. We are ready to start our public meeting. And so it looks like I can see Harry and Darcy and Zaria. So we'll start with our student update. Okay, yeah. So we definitely have a lot to discuss this mm -hmm. week. Sorry, I kind of lost my voice a little bit earlier today. So if I sound a little <laughs> off, that's definitely why. Um, oh, okay. So it got a little out of order. There we yep, go. There you go. <laughs> so we've had this on our sides for definitely a couple of weeks now, but there's still a lot of anxiety surrounding COVID with like the increased caseloads at school. And I think it's something that people are starting to get used to at this point. And um, mm -hmm. I think like we've said, the teachers are usually pretty good about being accommodating with absences and things like that. Yeah. And I've seen the use of Zoom a little bit more, which I think is good and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I would say, I think um, still a lot of students are finding it a little bit challenging being out, um, especially around finals week, because it's definitely preferable um, if you have finals to, to be in school and to be studying. But um, I think teachers are, are doing their best, um, especially those are who, who are out right now. Yeah. Um, I don't know for Zara and Felicity, who I'll introduce in a minute, if you yeah. guys want to talk a little bit about the experience for a freshman. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I think um, for this being like freshman finals, I feel like they're being a lot more lenient and being like less pressure is being put on to us because it's our first time being out of hybrid, a hybrid scenario. And, you know, a lot of the stuff surrounding COVID right now. Yeah, for sure. And mm -hmm. I don't know if I'll see if you have like a slightly different experience. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> sorry. So as you can probably tell, I'm, I just got COVID last week. So having COVID like close to finals has been a little bit stressful because I've been trying to study for finals and other tests at the same time. But I do agree with Zaria that there definitely has been like the teachers have been um, relatively understanding and flexible with that. So that has mm -hmm. been nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say from the sophomore perspective, personally, um, I, it hasn't been too bad um, of a no. load for finals. I, I think, think we're approaching what yeah. it would have been in a typical year I think before COVID. also a lot of people are just kind of reaching the end of the year that comes naturally or yeah. are kind of feeling tired and ready for summer. A little but, bit of burnout. For yeah. Sure. And then, so like we're kind of done, I think, with the bigger events, the seniors, things like that. Obviously, mm -hmm. graduation stuff right. happened last weekend. But coming up, we have the sophomore semi formal on Friday, which had been a long standing tradition at CC. Um, it went away with COVID and it's back this year, which is really exciting. I know that the ticket sales have been even better than like ever yeah. before. Yeah. So, for Darcy and I, that's definitely something very exciting that's coming up. Mm -hmm. um, and class government is all, or do you want to talk about this? Yeah, of course. Okay. okay, so class government is hosting feel good finals. Um, so they're kind of trying to, to reduce some of the stress and make it a bit more fun um, because finals are stressful for a lot of people. Um, so there's different activities being hosted that are kind of like arts and craft projects. There's going to be an ice cream truck on, I believe it's the final day of finals yeah. um, and different things like that. Um, and then also um, the eighth grade orientation took yeah. place last week. I don't know. Also, sorry, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, we were course. actually in the same group. Because I, I was, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> no. yeah, yeah, I was supposed to do it, but I was out. So sorry, I can talk about that. Yeah. Um, I feel like it was, I feel like the eighth graders got to see a lot. We got to take them into some of the classrooms and, you know, show them uh, like some of the teachers and stuff like that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> We were actually in the same group, which was cool. And I think it was good too. We did like a little Q and A. Like she was saying, we went into a lot of the like class of our own teachers, the sort of interrupted class for a minute to introduce them to the teachers. Um, and then yeah, graduation happened. Obviously I was there just to like celebrate and take pictures of some of my senior friends. Mm -hmm. And then we're thinking since this is one of our last meetings of the year, if we could go through and sort of talk a little bit about like how we think this year has gone. We have mm -hmm. now representation from two grades, so. yeah. Yeah, yeah, so first the, want to start. the freshman perspective, anything you guys want to share? Felicity, do you want to go first or should I? Um, you can go ahead. Uh, personally, uh, like with Freshman Academy, I think it's been pretty interesting. Uh, basically, Freshman Academy is like when you get to, when we all get put in like the separate groups with the teachers and the students so we can better like get to know each other for high school so it can be a better like integration and like growth I guess and I don't think it's been completely um easy I don't know I feel like that next year it's not going to be easy for me to like get used to not seeing people I've seen for the entirety of my freshman year 
And I don't know, I think I'll have to get used to that. I feel like it delays the, the like the step that you take when you first get into high school. Um, but that's just personally what I think of it, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I have a lot of like similar perspectives. I think like um, my team, the Oak team, we took two field trips this year. So like I did get the chance to get really close with the people who were on my team. Um, but also like it was a little bit hard sometimes um, when I had friends who weren't in any of my classes because we were on different teams and we never really got to see each other um, if we didn't have the same lunch block. So I think it is definitely, I did enjoy like getting um, this good sense of community with the people in my classes and on my team, but it would also, I personally think that it would also have been nice to have like more diversity um, in the people in my classes. So I'm excited for that next year. For sure, yeah. Yeah, I think we we had similar experiences yeah. probably. And I think mom. we can try and quickly talk about sophomore year. Yeah. So I would say it's definitely been a pretty good like introduction to regular high school. I think I was saying this earlier at finals, but I feel like yeah. we pretty much approached what a normal school year would have been like. Mm -hmm. And I also think one of the biggest components of sophomore year is prepping for your junior year when the like class yeah. level and workload really is taken up a notch. And from talking to like some of my friends who are currently just finishing up their junior year, I think we're pretty well prepared. And mm -hmm. I think it's been a good experience overall. And I think the transition between freshman and sophomore year, like you guys said, it's a little bit daunting, but you definitely get over it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I think all things considered, it's been pretty good. Yeah, um, I would I would definitely agree. I think um, we were a little bit lucky in some ways that we had sort of still sort of a semi-COVID, semi-normal um, start to the year, which kind of allowed for a smoother transition. So I can definitely see how it could be daunting for, for freshmen coming in to kind of be exposed to the level of work and expectations we have on like the second half of the year um, after having a much more lenient um, like COVID freshman academy experience. Um, I do think though, by the, by the end of sophomore year, we're definitely feeling much more prepared for junior yeah. year. Um, and it's just been a great experience being able to be in class um, back totally normal for the first time in a while. For sure. And then we just have a quick little looking ahead yeah. slide. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I can just take this first point. I know this is something we've been saying for a long time, but our goal is to have the middle school student council representatives, if they wanna have like some feedback for, mm -hmm kind of one of the last meetings come to the next meeting or even just like share some points if we were to go to the middle school to one of the meetings and get some yeah. points for you guys just to get some more perspective from other schools and I don't know Felicity if you want to take this next one yeah okay so hi um I'm Felicity and I know I've already said some things but um yeah so I'm the part of the class of 2025 so I'm going to be a sophomore next year um and since Darcy is elected was elected to be the secretary for student senate congrats <laughs> thank you um i'm going to be taking over well okay that sounds like really <laughs> condescending sorry but i'm going to be filling in um on school committee for darcy next yeah. year yes and um felicity is uh definitely one of our most um, present and vocal freshmen so we're super excited yeah. um, and I, I really ex uh, appreciated my experience this year um, and you'll definitely still yeah pop in yeah for sure time. for sure um, yeah so I just wanted to say thank you and uh, can't wait to see Felicity you do a great job thank you <laughs> yeah, thank you so much great thank you so much um, Darcy we're sad to see you go but you can of course come at any point because our meetings are open and you can come visit us and welcome Felicity and so next year It'll be Harry, Felicity, and Zaria, correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay, great. Well, we're looking forward to that. Um, it looks like you guys have been really busy, and I do currently have an eighth grader who went on one of your fabulous tours. So uh, it's definitely a highlight for the eighth grade to come to the high school. So thank you. Yeah. For that. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great and the updates have been very robust. So thank you for that. One more meeting, and then we'll see you back in September. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. All right. All right. We are going to move on to public comment. And we will start with public comment in the room. And just a reminder that this is a meeting in the public, but not with the public. So if there are any um, comments in the room, we will take those first. And just as a reminder, you have three minutes. 
So seeing no one on the room, if you are on Zoom, please raise your hand if you have a public comment to make. Seeing no hands, we will move on to our next agenda item, which is recognitions. Um, sure. Um, Justin's coming up to talk about the Playbook Initiative, which is an anti-discrimination and anti-bias um, prevention program. To those who don't know out in the public, I think we're all um, aware of what the Playbook Initiative is in this room. Um, and I just wanted to say that my seventh grader was not a leader this year, but my seventh grader who says, well, virtually nothing about anything, um, <laughs> did come home the day that the leaders were in the classroom and said, I think this is something I might want to do next year. And given how, um, you know, typical seventh grade boy, I think that is just one anecdote of, I assume, many that demonstrates that this program is pretty exceptional. If it can rouse my son, it can rouse. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Justin to um, walk us through your presentation. Well, thank you, Alexa. I really appreciate that. We appreciate that. Um, I do want to give a shout out to Harry, Zaria, Darcy, and Felicity. It's almost like they were an administrative team I worked with a couple of years ago. Um, so uh, amazing that they're still doing yes, yes. Uh, such wonderful things up at CC. So there are three Playbook student leaders who are on Zoom. Um, and I would invite them to turn their cameras on. Um, and we're gonna start with a video that was actually showed, um, it was shared last night in our rising uh, sixth grade parent night. We had about 240 parents um, on our Zoom last night. And this is just a portion of the video that was shared so that we can introduce the playbook and the work that we do in this anti-discrimination um, program with our fifth grade parents. I could narrate. No. <laughs> <laughs> is there any way that? To... Oh, there is. Oh. Tracy, do you have your sound sort of on, but muted? Like, I get to turn on your volume, your speaker, not your, not your microphone. I could join the audio. Come join the audio and see if I try it. Video looks pretty glitchy too. There's no sound. Left. Yeah, why don't you describe a little bit what's going with it? And okay. Take so is, is somebody it on the controls right now? If they want to just Aaron's on the controls. So you want to go back? Yeah. She's at home. Oh, Aaron? Yeah. <laughs> how do you guys <laughs> yeah. do this? <laughs> Aaron, go back to the beginning. He's going to talk us through it because we can't hear the sound. So is if Aaron is muted on her computer, that's the fix right there. Ah, so all she Aaron, has to do is can you unmute. unmute and hit the play button again? And just make sure, Aaron, your volume is turned up. Ah, there we go. You're so smart, Mr. Kim. <laughs> Bring me back to last year. Stepping through some important life lessons, student leaders with the Playbook Initiative spent Thursday leading discussions about race, religion, and gender orientation. They also played out different scenarios that were written by students. It's all part of an anti-discrimination and anti-bias program run by Project 351 and the Celtics Shamrock Foundation, which was inspired by the team's 2016-17 roster. With middle school students, such an important time. So great to do that when they're that age. Right, yeah. It's nice to see that they're making that a priority. Yeah, yeah. Well, there were... This is the Playbook Initiative at Concord Middle School. Part of the off-court legacy left behind by the 2016-2017 Boston Celtics team, the Playbook Initiative 
seeks to leverage the power of sport, more specifically, the appeal of the Celtics to engage middle schoolers on critical and plaguing societal issues. Started in 2017 and 2018, the Playbook Initiative is an anti-discrimination and bias prevention training for middle school students and adults. The training centers on a social playbook written by middle school students that inspires a dialogue on race, religion, gender, and disability, and ultimately equips those who participate in the workshop with the tools to intervene in challenging social situations. The goal of the training is to teach those who engage in the workshop to be more aware of discrimination and how to respond when it happens. Too often teens, even adults, are either the target of teasing or are witnesses to bullying and feel unprepared in how to act. Individuals who lead the Playbook Initiative report that they feel much more equipped in responding, being an upstander, and with the understanding of telling a trusted adult when the teasing or bullying happens. Concord Middle School was one of the first schools selected to engage in the Playbook Initiative in 2018. Since 2018, over 400 Concord Middle School students, 200 adults, including support staff, bus drivers, parents, teachers, members of the community, including the Concord Police, school committee members, and Concord Public School leaders, have participated in the Playbook Initiative. Okay, Since Aaron, 2018, the video there, please. following coaches and players have partnered. Thank you. Okay, the video was a little glitchy, apologize. Um, if we could share the Playbook student leaders. I could invite them to put their cameras on and unmute themselves and introduce themselves. We'll start with Layla in sixth grade. You want to just introduce yourself? Um, hi, my name is Layla Smith. And our seventh grader, Sophia. Hi, my name is Sophie Redmond in the seventh grade. And the committee might um, recognize Tyler, who visited the committee <laughs> earlier this school year as our Project 351 ambassador. Tyler, you want to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Tyler. And on the video, um, you may have saw, you may have um, seen the spot where Tyler was with Grant. Uh, is it Grant Wiggins? Uh oh. <laughs> Grant Williams. Williams, that's right. I'm sorry. Um, do you want to just share a little bit about that, Tyler, that experience you had at the Celtics practice facility and what you brought back as a playbook student leader? Yeah, sure. So if you don't know already, I'm the Project 351 ambassador for Concord. So there were some Project 351 ambassadors who were able to go to the Auerbach Center in Boston to do the playbook training. And we were able to meet Brad Stevens, and he talked to us a little bit about the importance of leadership. And then Jalen Brown made a quick appearance, and then Grant Williams and Sam Hauser actually did the training with us, which was a lot of fun. And then when I came back to the middle school, I was able to form a leadership team with some, some of my friends. And then we went to Ripley and did the training with the 70 student leaders. And we ran the training in the five different groups so the other trainers could see what it looked like. And we had pizza and it was just a, a very fun day. And then when we did the training, I found that the students were much more open when other students were leading. And we had a timer and slideshow going in the background to make sure we stayed on track. And I thought it was super beneficial and it was so awesome that we were able to train every student. So a great experience overall. Sophia, do you want to speak a little bit about, Tyler mentioned there were 70 students at the Student Leader uh, Playbook Leadership Summit that we had here at Ripley. Do you want to share, do you remember why we had exactly, it was actually 75, do you remember why we need 75 student leaders? Um, uh, I think some like couldn't make it or something. So I was one of those like last minute ones where I had some like quick training done. So I didn't actually go to like the big one, but I, got caught up the day before. Do you remember though, what, what is important about the number 75? 25 in each grade. 
Oh, so you could have a one liter per home base. There you go. Trade. So we ran, we ran the um, playbook initiative through our home base advisory program this year. Um, and the Celtics were very interested and so is Project 351. We're the first school to actually run the program for the entire student body and all of our faculty and staff. So it's quite the undertaking. Um, I wanna thank the administrative team, all the teachers and staff who gave up um, almost three hours of their school day in May uh, for this program to pretty much take um, the entire school over. Layla, do you wanna share just a little bit about your experience leading a sixth grade home base? Um, yeah, it was, not gonna lie, I was kind of nervous before, um, but because we were like the same age group and I didn't think they would take anything serious that I would say, but it was really fun and I got lucky that I knew a couple of the kids in the home base. Um, when I came in, like, it was really fun. Um, everybody started clapping and then we played the video, but we had some tech um, issues. So we ended up playing Hangman for like 25 minutes and it was really fun. So we got to know everybody. Um, I, I did have fun, the home base ambassador, I think. Yeah, the home base, no, the home base advisor um, helped us through it a lot. We had pixie sticks and I, I just had a really fun time and it really showed me that um, I could do things that I didn't know that I could do. Do you remember reflecting with me about um, your recommendation for next year about the t-shirt? Remember seeing me in the hallways afterwards? Oh yeah, the sizes aren't accurate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we have to go, we have to go from what? Long sleeve to what? Oh, long sleeve to short sleeve because uh, the day I wore it, it was burning hot. Like it was like so hot outside. So, um, when I got home, I ended up cutting the sleeves off because <laughs> that's awesome. This was, our, this was our reminder to remind the school committee of our very warm buildings. Point <laughs> 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 taken. <laughs> yeah. yes. What a great idea. Uh, Sophie, do you want to share a little bit um, more about your experience um, at Sanborn and with your seventh grade group? Um, yeah, I had a pretty good group. And as long as I like started a topic that they were like interested in talking about people would like people were really talkative and stuff. And so, I mean, I really liked the video that was helpful. Although we did at one point when we finished a discussion early, people had a stretch break because they had been like sitting down the whole time. And so that was good. And then I was like, um, with the home base advisor, it was nice because like they, so if I, if they could tell that I needed help in like a situation, then they would help. But then most of the time I got to like be able to be a student leader and stuff and be able to talk. So that was nice. And so I found it like a fun experience and everything. Great. Tyler, you want to wrap us up? Anything else you want to reflect on and give advice yeah. to the sixth six and seventh grade student leader for next year? Yeah, I would say my group was great. I had I had two home bases combined, and everyone contributed a, well. And the home base advisor stepped in when they needed to, but they mostly let me and the other uh, leader do it. And some advice I have for the sixth and seventh grade students on this call is just I would say do it again. I mean, try to get your friends to do it. It's a great experience and I had a lot of fun. Great, thank you. Any questions for our student leaders? Excellent job yes. presenting. Sorry about that. Um, I just think it's so great to see you guys in here with us. This is my favorite part of the meeting when we actually have kids here. So I appreciate hearing it from your perspective and it's tricky when you have to get up in front of your home base and you're actually the teacher. So that takes a lot of courage to do that. So thanks for that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's a great example of how we engage students with engaged students. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> truly. Truly work. All right. Eight minutes.
So on to, we have two sets of minutes tonight. We have the minutes from April 5th and, sorry, May 5th and May 10th we should have received. So any uh, questions, comments on those before? I'd like to put a hold on May 10. I have a small correction. I'd like to get off to Aaron if you'll Thank indulge you. me on that. Sure. Thank you. Okay, so I would entertain a motion to approve the open session minutes from May 5th of 22. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Thank you to uh, Aaron for faithfully keeping all the minutes. Yes. Yes. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. All right, on to correspondence with the region. We received three pieces of correspondence this week. One was a thank you to our school committee for our time spent during our meetings, which was greatly appreciated. Uh, one was in regards to an eighth grade civics project and perhaps um, one of those members was just on with us. So our eighth grade has been very engaged with us through these projects, which has been wonderful. And one was on security specifically at CCHS. Sure, and at, the, at Concord Public, we had six pieces of correspondence, um, one from our MECO Families Collective, one from an organization called Ballotpedia that's doing um, collection of data on school boards across the country. They're endeavoring to compile lists for all of them, no small undertaking. We had two emails about uh, the eighth grade civics products project from our eighth graders, um, one about school security and one about a parent concern. Okay, and on to chairs and liaison's report. So we're going to start with CPS. So Alexi, you want sure. To that? Um, okay, we had Court. I know you were at the select board last night. Tried to call you, and you were engaged. So did you want to report mm -hmm. out on that? Yeah, certainly. Uh, the uh, director of public works referenced the uh, capital needs of the town, and included on that list is the uh, the Doug White Field. Um, which uh, he believes will be uh, a uh, warrant item uh, coming up in 2023 for fiscal 24. Uh, details forthcoming. I'm sure uh, school administration will be in touch with, with Alan Cathcart on that. Also, the moderator, town moderator, Carmen Reese, uh, presented a draft calendar to the select board and uh, uh, they made a few minor changes to it, and I have forwarded that to all of you just uh, this evening. Uh, the uh, plan is for a special town meeting this fall because there is a deadline for some state funding pertinent to DPW that uh, has a deadline attached. Um, and uh, so that means that perhaps there'll be other items added to that special town meeting. And then the regular uh, town meeting is slated for, give me a moment here, uh, Sunday, April 30th, 2023 at the high school. And that's, uh, that's all I have from the select board. Cynthia, can we go to you with the DEI? I just said the warrant closes January 4th. What? The warrant closes January oh. 4th. So that's not far away. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, that was one of the corrections that was made last night. Yeah, yeah. Um, so PEG Access Advisory, I'm just coming up to speed, but they do have an interesting process underway with an RFP for the uh, renewal of the Comcast cable franchise. So it's a pretty big deal for um, MMN and the town and for everybody actually in Hunter and Carlisle. So I'll, I'll try to dig in. We interview in the next session the applicants uh, to the RFP on the 16th um, in the afternoon. So <clears throat> that would be interesting. And then the contract is due to be awarded on July 1st. And did you also attend the DEI commission? Or was that? No, that well, was before last week. That was a long time ago, it seems like. <laughs> uh, so they had a lot of conversations. I hope that the recording is up about, they did have a lot of conversation about the MECO. Um, situation, um, and I'm reluctant to report this is a very, probably almost an hour, so I, I wouldn't be even able to summarize that. It was a lot of participants and a lot of conversation. So I will go, I didn't get a chance to check up MNN okay. as posted the video. So I will definitely Thanks. check and 
circle back with you on that. And I supposedly they're going to meet again soon. But I haven't okay. seen anything yet. <clears throat> and court will save our building committee till CPS part of our larger discussion. So I bet. Okay. And we will move on to the region. So Dalton Community Ed. Pardon? Dalton Community Ed. Yes. So Dalton Community Ed uh, hasn't had a meeting since I've been around, but I did get an update from them and, and they refer to the chill refers to this as a quietly busy time of the year. So they've got a lot going on. She says we have a handful of adult education classes still running this spring and are busy working on the fall schedule already. The new adult English learning language learner program will start in mid July and they received $1,200 from the Community Justice Cornerstone grant for that program. So yay. Um, we have about 10 to 12 students that are in the process of enrolling for that program so far. And on the driver's ed side, June and July summer classes, this is important to those listening at home, June and July classes are already full, but there is still space in the two August classes. That was as of last Thursday. So I don't know if it's still yeah. true. Um, and um, let's see, they do have new instructors who are newly certified as driving instructors. And so that's exciting that, that they're getting a little more capacity. Um, and then we have, let's see, IMSCC music lessons are winding down for the semester, but they're busy enrolling the students for the summer and excited to offer some of the long running uh, popular music workshops again, including summer band, trombone choir, trumpet workshop, and they will open registration for fall lessons on today, June 7th. <laughs> Perfect. All right, thank you. Many uh, thanks to Jill. Yeah. All right. And then we have our Superintendent's Metco Advisory Council. Carrie and I sit on that. Carrie's going to give an update on that. Yeah, sure. So, um, Tracy, Dr. Hunter, and I met with um, Representative Superintendent Council last Tuesday, um, May 31st. And we um, talked a little bit about adding uh, the new policy to add a Metco representative to which we'll get into later. Um, they, in general, seem to really appreciate the around the edits that we made. Um, mm -hmm. there wasn't much feedback on that. Um, we had a lengthy discussion around professional development, um, what we're doing at a staff level, um, what's going well, where there's room for growth and improvement, and I um, and we're continuing that conversation. Um, and then there is we're working on finding another time to the end of June. Great. Just end of july <laughs> <laughs> and we'll continue on in the fall after that yes so. and, yes and we're actually part of the part of the july discussion was how do we kind of formalize the schedule so that we don't have to go through the pain of <laughs> scheduling yes scheduling is always challenging yeah um, and sharon and i sit on andrew's dei strategic steering committee we've had um sharon has stepped up from it so i'll give a quick update we've had oh, i think three sessions our fourth session is on Thursday, and it is students, it's teachers, it's administrators, it's school committee, it's Andrew. Um, Andrew runs breakout rooms, and we actually really do work for a solid hour. He's very good about managing us and giving us a task to accomplish at every meeting. And I think we spoke a little bit about this at our last meeting, but our thought um, when we did dissolve the DEI subcommittee was to kind of roll into the strategic steering committee. So we actually are participating in that committee. Um, so our next meeting is on Thursday and then we will meet, I think that's gonna be the last one of the year. Are you, I think Sounds it is. Right. And then it will be monthly in September. So that's the update there. And that's all I think we have. Perfect. All right. So on to, we are on to the discussion portion, which I will hand it over to Lori, but I just want to say, oh, I love- I have updates. Oh, you have updates. Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Lori, I missed you. I skipped your report. Yeah. I was so excited to see all the principals here. They're sorry. very excited too. <laughs> um, my updates are focused on two topics primarily that just were timely. Uh, and further updates to MECO on other pieces of what we're working on in addition to the topics at the advisory group. Um, we had a really fantastic last session with the leaders from METCO headquarters who came out about 10 days ago and spent the morning with about 25 
uh, high school Metco students and us as leaders, Mike and his team, and really took the priorities that the students had worked on with the um, pre in the previous sessions with the Metco headquarter leaders. They had come up with a list of 13 items they wanted us to consider. Uh, Andrew and team spent some time culling them because five of them are already in progress. So we named that and didn't spend time on those. Then as a group, we collectively, well, the kids collectively prioritized among the other eight, what their top three were. So we've got that list, we're working with them. Um, probably one of the biggest ones is they're gonna get a ded dedicated space at the high school. It's been a little bit of a shared space until now. A dedicated space and they really want to own that space, design it, make it purposeful and um, help us know what they need in that to make it their own. So more to come on that as those goals take, take form in the fall. Uh, also, we've posted for the CPS side of the director position. Uh, so that's up and we have resumes coming in. Andrew's working with Denise to manage that process and putting a committee together and screen resumes, put a committee together, interview with a very ambitious goal of um, hoping to have a finalist even as soon as the end of this month. Um, Deb Jemison is excited and anxious to take on the CCHS director position and really make that her own, uh, really knowing what an opportunity is to work with kids at that age. And as she's, the words she used with me was mold them and support them. So we're, we're grateful for all of her activity and work this year as acting director and then in the fall. Uh, we were able to go into Boston last Friday, Mike and I and Andrew and a few other members of the um, leadership and graduate a young man who could not attend on Saturday and Metco Inc really did the whole place up and had food and we were there with mom and grandma and it was just a really great, great event that morning. And then finally, we're spending time at both K-8 and the high school looking at our staffing for the fall. That's gonna go on into the, into the summer for sure. Um, both what our needs are academically, social, emotional, otherwise. So um, it wouldn't be budget increases, it would be re reallocations. We've got a little attrition um, in a certain few spaces. So more to come on what, what we're gonna build under the directors so that we have supports in the schools as well. So I think that's where we are, but it's been a really great, great few months working with kids, staff, parents, families. It's felt really collaborative. We're making progress. There's a roadmap ahead of us for sure, but I think we've all named common priorities and are working together toward them. It was really exceptional to see. I don't know if any um, one subscribes, but the MECO director, Millie, um, puts out a weekly email sort of detailing what um, what's going on in, in, in all over the state with respect to METCO. And I couldn't help but notice um, we kind of dominated her we entire newsletter this week <laughs> because there's so much um, so much activity that is positive mm -hmm. and forward thinking happening in the district. And it was nice, it was nice to see it highlighted by, you know, even just outside our own our own mm -hmm. committee here. So I don't want to understate how much work there is to do, but <laughs> right. it's a collective collaborative effort now. And that's really important. Yeah. And, um, my last comment is a number of us are going to the Beco conference on Friday in Framingham called Living the Legacy. She's invited Dr. Adolph Brown in, who a number of us have seen in the past. And um, he does this fantastic dramatization that you can't, your implicit bias shows before it shows. I can't give more away or it'll give away how he actually does that, but you go down a path of your own in responding to him and then he reveals something very different and you have to stop yourself and realize, oh, I just went all sorts of assumptions and need to slow, slow myself down. So looking forward to that. My other update is on security. Um, we certainly are very invested in security of the schools and everything to do with security. We're, obviously as concerned as everyone based on the tragedy in Texas two weeks ago and every school shooting. I mean, it's just unfortunately a sad state of where we are in the schools and American culture in general. Um, pieces that we've had in place, COVID interrupted us for sure. We're reinstating and we'll come back full plan in place in the fall. We are an Alice district. I think it's really important we say that. Um, our teachers are aware of the pieces of Alice. We have not drilled in a couple of years because 
gathering kids in a big group in a corner of a room under a lockdown doesn't fit with distancing. So we need to regroup the drills. Um, we are actively talking about drilling in the elementary schools, which is not something we've done in the past, but the needs and the you know, need for kids to know what to do probably outweighs. And we're gonna talk a lot about how to not make that traumatizing. And certainly I've already started that conversation with the police. We had a staff meeting last night um, with the elementary teachers and help them hear where our mindsets will be as we make those plans. Um, the second piece is really tightening the buildings up. K-5 doors are locked all the time and there's no entrance. Middle school and high school, the place where COVID interrupted us again because ventilation precluded locked doors was um, where the swipe cards are required. Those all need to be reset and reestablished. The middle school by the mods and then um, the open campus issue is the other one. So Peter Kelly and I quickly talked this morning. There's a lot of new technology out there that will make this easier. Um, potentially. So we're going to spend the summer looking at that. Crisis Go is an app that we've had in pilot waiting to roll out for years now, um, where that we should be able to hit the ground running in the fall. Um, everyone can have it on their phone, staff, students, everyone gets a hot red button to hit to get police urgently and immediately, because we all know the main office is not the way that that is likely to happen. Um, and it'll also give us communication with the police during crisis. And in buildings where cell service and all of that can be tricky, um, we can be on the wireless network and have more reliable means of knowing what's going on. Um, so we're excited to get that off. And then the final thing, which I think is frankly the most important, when we have any report of anything concerning going on with a situation or an individual, a familiar individual or an unfamiliar individual that feels different or somewhat off-putting, we don't just ignore that. We actively encourage and ask our our community report that to us, people do. And a lot of this, because it doesn't turn into anything, quietly happens with us and the police and people are checked on and we all come to a place of comfort. Nothing acute was threatening, but we are always in the mode of doing those low, low level pieces. So I think that's probably the most important piece is the ongoing security mindset, um, both in terms of kids and adults in need, but also in terms of kids and adults who, um, maybe something different that we're not normally expecting and really getting at that early. So a lot more to come in the fall as we roll everything out tightly. We finally have an emergency plan that we updated thoroughly with the Concord Police in the fall of 2019, ready to roll it out literally in March and we closed. So that's gonna get its um, electronic dust taken off of it and pushed out to the staff so that we can be sure they're thoroughly informed. So thanks for giving us a chance to update all of that. It's been underneath the radar a little in terms of communication, but not gone for sure. Any questions? Well, I, I just like to note how important it is that you reference the mindset. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that safety is everybody's business, I think, uh, is more significant than all the technology we can bring to bear um, to have students, staff, teachers, aware that it's, it's their responsibility. Um, and we need practice in saying to a person new to us in the hall, may I help you, as opposed to one of these. Um, it's, it's a big cultural shift. And so I'm, I'm impressed that you're moving as assertively as you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Now I can say I'm really happy to see all the principals in the room. We saw you on Zoom last year, but it really is impressive to see you all here. So welcome to our meeting. We're happy to see you. And I'll turn it to Lori to run us through this. Yeah, so they are all here. I'm going to just remind you that all the school improvement plans come off of a process with the school councils. So they've been working with them. Um, they are also based off of the strategic plan. So the template that's been filled out and completed by every building and is posted online reflects the initiatives of the district. And that's by design so that we have common direction and goals. Within that, you'll see individual schools doing their way of doing it. Each individual building has its own needs and wants. Um, and so there's tweaks within those goals, but with, you know, tight and loose all at the same time is always the, the purpose. Um, what we've asked them to do tonight is not to go through the whole plan. We're gonna assume that you've read it um, but highlight three things out of their goals for 
22-23 to just bring to your attention and then be here for any questions and things you want to talk about. Perfect. So Mike's coming up first. Yeah. CC and Jess. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, where am I going for you? Yeah, we just need to sit. Come sit. Come sit. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for uh, allowing me some time to speak about the, the high school school improvement plan. And I saw some of you at graduation. It was a good event. So uh, nice to see everybody. Um, so I, I will, as Lori said, we're just going to touch upon a few points and you know, all the goals are, are obviously uh, important and we could you know, get into a discussion about ranking them. Some are kind of ongoing and I would, I would count ninth grade academy, um, our DEI work and MTSS, which is you know, also an offshoot of RTI is, uh, is kind of ongoing work in areas that we recognize um, in different levels that need to improve. Uh, the one I would like to highlight the most is the undertaking, uh, once again, of a schedule, um, a bell schedule overhaul. Um, and so I, I, this is my sixth year here, and I inherited the tail end of uh, a schedule review process. We've had the same schedule at the school for 22 years. Um, you know, our work with challenge success, uh, you know, I highlight this, this comment. We know how important the work of, um, of a bell schedule is, and it impacts every student every adult. And so it plays a really big role on, uh, you know, various different things. Uh, and, you know, challenge, challenge success highlights that as the most important thing you can do to, you know, to really impact a student's day-to-day -day existence. So um, the, the challenge with the Bell schedule is it's really difficult to please everybody. Um, and, you know, we can, as Kristen has often said, you know, we can, what's your famous line? We can schedule anything you want. We just can't schedule everything. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it's really about identifying what are the priorities. There are there are lots of uh, great examples out there. Ironically, um, before the pandemic, uh, Lori cited something else in terms of security that, you know, kind of was was close and then uh, get thrown to the back burner. I would say Bell schedule was very close. We were working with Gene Thompson Grove. We did have some consensus in the room um, after a really challenging. Um, process that I, again, I inherited when I first started that uh, was a, contra a little bit of a controversial bell schedule. So uh, that work, it will commend, it's already started to some degree and that the planning and identifying committee members, getting a timeline in place uh, with the, with the, it's a, it's a quick timeline. We want to have a new schedule identified by December. December is a really critical point because in order to implement it for the fall, it has to be ready by January. So it will be a major um, component of the work in the beginning of the year. We've done this process multiple times, so it's not like we're starting from scratch, um, but, uh, but this will be a very big undertaking. It's very exciting. Um, you know, there are a lot of great examples out there that I, I think we can, we can adopt uh, as a whole or in part. So I think that is uh, the most exciting part of uh, the work we have next year and the following year will be in place and, and I'm looking forward to that process unfolding. That's great. That's exciting. I love a new schedule. 22 years. 22 years. Yeah, that's a long time. As, we, as I said today at the, uh, the staff meeting, there are kids graduating college that has right. essentially the same schedule. So I think it's education has changed a little bit in 22 years. And so Bell's schedule needs to, to need to change as well. Great. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're next. You're up. <laughs> in the middle, right? Yeah, always in the middle. Not first, not last. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. <laughs> All right. Um, so I really just want to highlight three things from the middle school school improvement plan. Uh, I do want to thank the students, parents, faculty, and staff who make up our school council um, and putting together this draft plan. Uh, so the first of which um, is going to be a presentation made through Christian's office, um, I believe, to this committee next week um, about the work that um, we're engaged with with STAR 360 um, and PAIR as well, and just the importance of continuing to assess our students um, locally and use that uh, assessment and that data for 
um, informing decisions in the classroom, but also informing decisions in class placement in our now three-year-old RTI, RTE program. RTI is response to intervention. RTE is response to enrichment and supporting all our students who are in need of high achievement opportunities. Uh, the second goal I'd like to highlight is um, we're going to be piloting um, throughout the school an entire year a PBIS, which is a positive behavior incentive systems. Um, if you talk to many administrators across the state, um, many of us uh, felt somewhat ready for um, the support of mental health of students coming back from the pandemic. Um, many of us were caught off guard with the discipline numbers. Um, and we're ready for that extinction burst to actually burst um, and to really focus on um, all the students who bring such positive light to the middle school. Um, and really celebrating them monthly. Um, we have partnered with Concord Ed Fund um, in this area of our school improvement plan, um, where we're gonna be celebrating and teaching um, explicitly through our home-based advisory program, a characteristic of the month, um, like one of the months we are going to be teaching in a home base what inclusion looks like at Concord Middle School. And after the first week or so of teaching that through uh, videos, Towards the days, and stories, um, books that are on display in our library, uh, possible um, assemblies. Um, we are then going to be um, celebrating those students who portray that word, um, and exemplify that word um, by really propping them up and celebrating them in our school community. We're essentially doing what our end of the year awards do, but all we do for our end of the year end of the year awards is celebrate students at the end of the year. <laughs> um, and we have a lot of uh, past students and faculty and staff who are named after these awards um, and characteristics such as perseverance, um, inclusion, kindness, which are three of the 10 words we're gonna be teaching through the PBIS program next year. Um, again, are words that describe former faculty and staff and students who we have awards named after. So we had a school improvement plan. Uh, we had a school improvement goal this past year, rethinking our end of the year awards and how can we celebrate those qualities throughout the entire school. So we're doing that through um, PBIS, and I want to thank Concord Ed Fund uh, for some of their fiscal support of, of our PBIS initiative for next year. Um, and finally, we're partnering through Kristen's um, office. Um, this will be a district for district wide restorative justice committee that's going to be forming um, and we're also putting together a committee um, at the middle school as well uh, to explore what restorative justice looks like at the middle school um, we're committed to having faculty and staff and maybe some students and parents um, be a part of this work as well thank you okay such good uh, work happening at the middle school it's impressive that's really neat mm -hmm. i like that pbis Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Now cuts alphabetically first. So. <laughs> Hello, Naomi. Hello. Welcome. All right. Um, so right, I'm not going to go over all the points, but I have a couple that I want to highlight. Um, the first one, and I, you've, you've heard about it a little bit already in the middle and the high school, um, is the MTSS framework that we're updating um, or adopting. I think for Alcott, the key there is really updating. Um, we have a lot of the structures in place um, through our RTI model. So we, we are already screening students. We're providing them with interventions. We have regular data meetings with progress monitoring. I think the piece that we've identified through the work with the MTSS committee this year is that we just need to be um, more purposeful in the supports that we're providing students. And so one of the things that um, we're really focusing on, you'll see on the um, the improvement plan is this, this idea of really being purposeful about matching the interventions to specific student needs based on the data. Um, and so, you know, while we feel like we're in a good place to do this because the structures exist, that that to us feels like the work that we really need to focus on is um, just being more deliberate in how we're matching interventions based on the data. Um, 
The other piece that I'd love to highlight um, is our continued expansion of our branch program for students with emotional disabilities. Um, since I started here, this is my third year now, um, the program has been changing every year and it's been growing every year, but it's been largely just kind of moving along in the grade levels. And we're now at a place where we actually, I think, get to truly expand vertically. And so we're gonna be opening another classroom next year, which means that we're gonna be able to meet the needs of students with um, significant emotional disabilities across the district from in grades K to five. So whatever the grade level is. Um, and we are really excited about that. And then I think just uh, sort of forward thinking, part of that work is also going to be thinking about now that we have a program that runs K to five, thinking about that expansion into the middle school. And so that work, that conversation will start this year in preparation for two years from now. Um, and then the other thing that I'd love to highlight um, it falls under the inclusive culture strand, um, which is, and so partnering with our DEI director, our METCO director, um, and our METCO families to ensure that students at Alcott who are part of the METCO program feel um, valued, respected, and welcomed at all grade levels. Um, I think after COVID, I don't know if we can say after COVID, uh, <laughs> but now that COVID has happened um, and continues to happen, there is really, uh, there's a big need that exists, I think, for everyone to rebuild that sense of belonging. Um, I think we're feeling it across, uh, you know, all grade levels, across all students. But um, we want to make sure that as we are rebuilding and building that sense of community, um, that we're really making a concerted effort to focus on our our students who are in the Meco program and our families who are in Meco. Um, there's different ways that that might work. It might be working with our PTG, who's really on board, to making sure that things that we plan are accessible to all families. Um, you know, it's individual outreach with families, um, and then also um, working with the DEI lead that's going to go into place to support our staff to make sure that they are feeling um, like they can do that work as well. So, thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Question, question if I yeah, might. Naomi. Um, you know, you talked about uh, more deliberate, intentional uh, intervention um, or, or bringing services yeah. uh, around MTSS. And I think the school committee knows that you've always been deliberate and intentional about that. So um, I, I'm thinking the the change that you're you're envisioning is uh, what I read here: um, communicating student progress toward goals during each intervention cycle, i.e., more evaluative uh, uh, work about the efficacy of those interventions. Is that how I could interpret what what you meant? Yeah, definitely, and making sure that whatever intervention that we select for a student based on the data is effective and then and then making those adjustments um, sort of in a timely and responsive manner. Yeah, yep. Great, good, thank you. Yeah. All right, Thanks, Sam. Thoreau, <laughs> we'll come up. Looks like Price is right, come on now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Two years since we've done this in person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And COVID, is not written on my school improvement plan. Wonderful. So that, that's something to celebrate, excited about. Um, so a couple of things I'd like to highlight um, about the Thoreau School Improvement Plan. I know that we've all talked about different portions of our implementation around the MTSS system. Um, something that I'm very excited about is um, consistently using the Dibbles 8th edition to monitor the progress of students who are getting um, intervention in reading. What I love about using this program to progress monitor is that there is um, a tiny data warehouse component that allows us to share student progress information and data with families um, at various points throughout the course of the year. So we will have very specific targeted data to share with parents um, at fall and spring conferences. So that's a huge win for us. So I'm very excited about that. A um, couple other things I'd like to highlight are, I see them as a more of a return to normal and past practice, things that we have not really been able to do. Um, prior to COVID, um, we were able to um, engage fifth graders um, in a four to six week smart executive functioning boot camp that was run by a special education teacher and a speech and language pathologist. Um, sometimes our pupil adjustment counselor would sub in for that. So we are very excited to be able to bring that in. We found it to be very effective. And it, at the time, it seemed um, easier to do when we were not mixing classes. And now we can, you know, bring cohorts of students together um, and hope that we're sending them to middle school better prepared on the executive function side of the house. Um, similarly to that, we're looking to revitalize a lot of our um, 
positive behavior intervention system, which included frequent assemblies um, and bringing the whole school together. So very excited about that. Um, Limit it to three. So I'll say the third is um, we are getting a facelift to our lower playground that includes um, all accessible playground structures. So that is going to be installed this summer. It's far overdue. I think we currently are using the structures that were on the old Alcott playground. Mm -hmm. um, so through fundraising efforts between the uh, PTG and the district, we were finally able to make that happen. I think that when you were, when Alexa, you were still yeah. a thorough parent on the PTG, yeah. my first year, you said, we've been sitting on this money. You know, mm -hmm. we need to do, so it's finally happening. Yes, so you're I'm pleased to know very that. Pleased. And, um, there Sorry. will be structures that all of the Thoreau students um, can access. So we're really excited about that. Yep. Excellent. Great. Good. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. And again, that's those are highlights. There's oh, yeah. breadth. Oh, we've one more. Oh, <laughs> yep. Mr. Lewis. He's going to give me a hard time when he gets up here. I forgot. He didn't know. She didn't notice. <laughs> Not okay, Mr. Lewis. <laughs> 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 uh, thank you again for all uh, taking the time to read the Willard School Improvement Plan. Again, we're going to be looking at just three areas tonight, but we're very proud of them. Uh, three uh, areas, the first of which is our continued work with um, uh, programming for students with language-based disorders uh, for general education, and then, uh, specifically with students with disabilities. We're going to train 10 additional staff members in Ready to Rise. Ready to Rise is um, a foundation's um, uh, uh, accelerated and intensive boost program. Uh, we began last year and we used it as part of our RTI process. It's <clears throat> now the MTSS process. And we're partnering with Wilson, actually, with um, we signed the MOU because they're interested because of the data that we provide that suggested incredible growth of these students. So we're going to train 10 students in Ready to Rise and seven more in foundations. Um, thanks to Debbie Dixon, who is here tonight. Uh, we're going to be partnering with Landmark Outreach. As you know, we are the language-based uh, classroom program, the uh, Language and Beyond, as it's now um, called. And we're going to be working with them for uh, PD and, and con uh, consultancy of special educators and regular educators, so in the partner classrooms. And um, we're going to be doing that throughout this year. It's going to begin this summer. And we've already kicked off and we have a, a scope of, of work and, and we're very excited you know, ever to excel. So we're looking forward to that. Um, Working with uh, Andrew Nemechi, uh, he came to our school as he's come to each of the schools to work with our staff about uh, looking at areas within his strategic plan that um, resonate with the particular building. And uh, one piece that we've decided that we're going to focus in on is regularly returning to best practices and case studies. We early on uh, been using a phrase called a little dirt on your face. It's a Sicilian expression which a good friend tells you when you have a little dirt on your face. Hmm. So when we are having these difficult conversations, uh, a good friend on staff will say, you got a little dirt on your face. Maybe let's talk about what you just said or how a student might feel by you doing that. Um, so rather in the moment, having those difficult conversations and having a little dirt on your face, we're taking time from our uh, faculty meetings to ensure that we continue that good work. Um, so we feel very good about that. And then lastly, um, I won't be able to tell you everything about this, and you'll know why in a minute, we're going to have a um, all grade, fifth grade read. Um, so it's gonna be a book that we're gonna to distribute to all fifth grade students. Um, it's gonna be one that's focused in on the environment, leadership, diversity, and inclusion. But it's gonna be a book that kids are really gonna to love to read. And it's a book that was selected using our new anti-bias um, reading criteria. Thank you, uh, Kristen. And we're going to be uh, sharing that book with um, the uh, rising fifth graders this week in their fourth grade classrooms. And we'll have enough for all students, of course. We're going to encourage their parents to read it as well. And um, if uh, parents are, for whatever reason, not in a position to purchase a book, we're going to have extra books available to them. So that's going to be an opportunity for them to have a voice, to be empowered um, uh, as they are the leaders in the building. Um, so we're very excited about those three initiatives, among our others. Right. Yes. Can you, when you reveal, can you share that with us? Oh, I certainly will. <laughs> You're really going to like it. Yeah. I, I, it's, I one that's, it. It's, it's, a, it's a, it's a book that's uh, been um, in the press uh, and well-regarded. Now you're going to make me Google and try to guess it. Yeah. <laughs> You'll love it. Thank you. 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 Th
Yeah. Great. Yes. Awesome. Great awesome. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. Does Thank you very much. Have any questions for the principals before we dismiss them? You I'm know? just be, well since they're here in person yeah. and one of my needs to bring them in person was just to publicly thank them because this is a really deep really talented team which even in a few minutes I, I love sitting back and just listening to them and not actually being part of it in the presentation so you can hear the threads of the work we're all doing together you can hear where they've got their individual pieces all of that's collaborative and led with the staff and everyone's going forward in the same boat um, and they do it well and they're really passionate, committed leaders and I'm just really grateful for them and um, wanted to be sure I said that. My last plug will be that the strategic plan does, is it headed into its fifth year of five. So I've already been in touch with Lori Likas, who is the facilitator we worked with five years ago. And she's very interested in working with us. We've got a little bit of a timeline and plan sketched out that I'll bring to you in the fall as we work through it. It's more of a renewal than a start over, which I think we're all, I believe would make sense. Um, and I'm just excited to see where that brings us. And it's, I think that's gonna be a great time coming out of COVID to really look forward for five years. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So more to come on that. Great. And I really enjoyed the way we did this this year because, you know, know, we got to preview them ahead of time and but we got to hear the good stuff. And that is, I think, what we really like to do as a committee. I do want to thank you all for your time, especially over the past couple of years. You've been fearless leaders in our schools. You've led your school. And we can't thank you enough for that. You know, you don't have a principal appreciation week, but we do appreciate you. The community appreciates you. And you've been asked to do a lot and you have delivered once again. So I'm proud to have you all in our district. So thank yeah. you. Thank you all. And I'm sure you have a lot to do tonight. So you can feel free to leave at any point. Or stay if you- if I you asked Mr. 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 to stay through the trips. Oh, so perfect. he may have to stay perfect. a little longer. Um, do you want me to take some? Yes, that'd be great. Uh, so next up, we are going to be hearing from our CPAC leadership. Um, if you guys want to come up, you're welcome to come at this time. Um, I just want to say um, this is their annual presentation that they give to us to summarize their achievements throughout the year. I have, you guys can sit down, please. I'm going to go Price is Right style. Yep, yes. Price is and Right style. You have to just share the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I move away anyway. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll give my broken record speech that I've <laughs> given a couple times in my recent updates, but this year has just um, felt very collaborative and very productive um, in ways that I think are are worthy of recognition. Um, I am always, I'm lucky that I get um, a preview into all that the CPAC does because I attend their monthly meetings. Um, this year has been one I feel that has been, you know, jam packed full of accomplishments. These guys have been advocating for students and families. They have been um, advocating on behalf of um, what? That's what It's been going off since, since a, a, a blue Honda. Blue Honda? Anyone? Oh, no. <laughs> but I have the keys. Good interruption. <laughs> I mean, no. Thanks, Thank Angel. Thank you. The neighbors must be okay. enjoying that. Oh, my. Yeah, that's been going on this whole time. Um, well, anyway, this is, these guys are an extremely active organization who work tirelessly on behalf of um, student populations in our special ed programs. So, um, like I said, I've had the preview into what they've been doing all year. Now you will get to see all of that as they take you through their annual report. So I will turn it over. Aaron will pull up the slides. Thank you, Alexa. No problem. Just want to waiting for the slide. Mm -hmm. I'd like to just emphasize we are a volunteer board. So if the slide presentation lacks pizzazz, that <laughs> is part of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Casey Atkins. I am the president of the Concord Public Schools and Concord Carlisle Regional School District Special Education Parent Advisory Council. 
our, um, sorry, Aaron, could you please advance to the next slide? I'm going to have to find a way to do that in a more smooth manner as it's going to be slide by slide. Um, sorry, Aaron, I think if you go back one more slide. Nope, I guess go forward. My apologies. Yeah. So our, our annual report overview focuses on our purpose, mission, our membership, focuses on our priorities and accomplishment this school year and what we're looking forward to in the year ahead. Please advance the slide. Thank you. Our purpose and charge are codified in Mass General Law and in Massachusetts regulations. Part of our charge is to advise the school committee on matters that pertain to the education and safety of students with disabilities and to meet regularly with school officials to participate in the planning, development, and evaluation of the school committee's special education programs. Our mission statement, this is something that is pulled from other CPACs around the state. It is also something that previous boards have put together and approved. Our mission is to ensure an appropriate education for children with disabilities and to foster and support a collaborative and inclusive culture in our schools and community that values diversity and recognizes the contributions and uniqueness of each learner. We work in partnership with the school administration and the school committee to support students and further their goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We provide outreach, support, and education to inform and empower families and members of the community through events, workshops, and communication via newsletters, social media, and our website. We welcome and encourage all members of the community to engage and take part in these efforts. Please advance the slide. I mean, I got a little nervous there when it danced, I'm not gonna lie. Our membership is comprised of parents, guardians, and caregivers of students on individual education plans and 504 plans and other interested parties. We strive to cultivate a membership that reflects the linguistics, linguistic, excuse me, religious, racial, cultural, geographic, and socioeconomic diversity of the districts and intends to include members from the preschool, each elementary school, the middle school, high school, inclusive of alternative and transition programs, 18 to 22 program, and out of district placements, inclusive of case collaborative. Our membership includes parents, guardians, and caregivers from Boston, Carlisle, and Concord. Thank you for bearing with me as I read through all of that. It is important because this year, as many of you know in the school committee, different dialogues were brought forward about inclusion, inclusion of our Boston families, inclusion of our other families who have felt marginalized. And it gave us the opportunity to look inward on our own board and look for opportunities to expand inclusion and be deliberate and intentional in our outreach. We'll talk more about that in these slides to come. Our current board membership is made up of myself. I am here tonight with the lovely. Hi, I'm Ashley Healy. I'm technology chair this year. Not here with us tonight is Sarah Betancourt, our membership chair, Carolyn Blackham, our secretary, Megan Carroll, our publicity chair, Kelly O'Donnell, our mem member at large, and Kristen Streeter Tarlow, our events chair. Please advance the slide. Part of what we do at the CPAC is we try to have liaisons in each of the schools and each of the programs. Now, this has been broadened over the years. We used to just have liaisons at each of the schools. And now as there have been specific programs at the schools, we are trying to branch out to those as well. So we've, we're looking, this is what we have proposed for the next year. We're looking to add two MECO liaisons for CPS and CCHS and to specifically add an ELL liaison since there are many families who fall into that category from our cohort. We are uh, delighted to have so many programs that have come about in the past five years in the district, and we are building out our liaisons for those programs. It's important for these parents to take part, to have a voice, and it's also a great feeder for our board. Please advance the slides. Our priorities and accomplishments this year focus on five areas improved communication and transparency with the administration and school committee. 
visibility and profile raising for the CPAC, engagement with the middle school building project, participation in the district's diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, and literacy and dyslexia guidelines and practices, getting further clarification and dialogue on those. Please advance the slide. Nothing like a really dynamic slideshow to just <laughs> keep you engaged in, you know, coming up in the second, you know, third hour of a school committee meeting. So I'm going to improvise just slightly here and start off by saying, what a difference a Debbie Dixon makes. <laughs> Debbie should have a huge shout out. And I want to highlight just how um, thoughtful and consistent the participation has been from the administration and from the school committee and not just our liaisons from all of you who have come to our events, who have attended our meetings and who have been engaged with us. We are so grateful for that. We know there is a lot on your plate and you guys are also volunteers in this effort as well. I'd like to highlight uh, Alexa Anderson and Eva Mustafi for their continued thoughtful collaboration. Eva is no longer a member of the school committee, but I'd like to inform you that she will indeed be a member of the CPAC board. We are hopeful <laughs> in the coming month when we have our board elections and we are thrilled, absolutely thrilled to have her. The participation from you all really means something and it makes our work together so much more meaningful and effective. And it also points out, I should say, each of the principals who just gave their presentation tonight highlighted on elements that are critical to our student populations. And if you are just tuning in now, I highly recommend you go back and listen to this principal updates, specifically in the areas of literacy, and we'll get into that further. We have deep appreciation for that. It was not always that way in many districts or in this district. And we appreciate the road that we are coming down together. I will go back to Debbie Dixon. <laughs> Debbie, Debbie has really set a standard that we'd like to take forward as a best practice in terms of communication and collaboration. Not just the fact that she helps me almost every other month improve the, fix the uh, Zoom link for our meeting, but because she is communicating what our programming is, what our continuum of, of services is for pre-K through 22, and that she's been very forthcoming with data regarding our student populations. As I said, she's the best practice that we would like to keep in place going forward. Debbie also assisted us and co-hosted coffees with the special education coordinators for the elementary schools, the preschool, the middle school, and the high school. Some of them were not well attended because of COVID and we tried to cram them in in one week, but they were all recorded and accessible to our members and uh, greater community. We're looking forward to the current, the program branding and descriptions that will be published in the district in the fall. And we look forward to making sure that our liaison positions align accordingly but we'd also like to give a lot of gratitude for the intensive MTSS, that's multi-tiered systems of support. Did I nail it? I nailed yeah. it. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> Presentation by the district. This was a collaborative effort. It was across each of the schools. It, include, it, it included administrators, principals, it included teachers, it included literacy specialists. And it was a really wonderful starting point for a dialogue that we hope to continue. And we're very grateful for the effort. Please advance the slide. I think you're a little voice arrest for a minute. <laughs> um, so uh, as Casey mentioned, one of our um, other goals for the year was visibility and profile raising for the CPAC. Um, I think our probably our most uh, well-known and best um, example of that was our fifth annual CPAC Appreciation Awards that took place on May 5th. Um, we invited all families with a child on an IEP or 504 plan to submit, um, and this was just a Google form, but it was to recognize any teacher or um, tutor, counselor, aide, administrator, any school staff member um, who made a difference to their student um, or students this year, since some of us have multiple kiddos on IEPs and 504s. Um, 
we had a record-breaking response to that invitation for nominations. We had a 116 submissions, which is more than we've ever had before. And um, those submissions were for 86 uh, distinct Appreciation Award recipients. So it was really, um, really an outpouring of, of appreciation. And it was really wonderful to see that much um, participation from our families. And um, yep, as I said, it was on the uh, We can have the next slide, please. Um, so during the ceremony, there were two student speakers who um, came up to recognize their honoree, um, Dr. Gary Reese from the high school. Um, so that was probably the most moving part. I definitely showed here. <laughs> tried not to, but I did. It was lovely. Um, the CPEC also recognized uh, Ann Bailey, who is a um, speech and language pathologist at the preschool, um, who received six different nominations, which is also a record breaker. Um, she's absolutely wonderful. Um, the CPAC also honored Debbie Dixon, our interim director of student services and Dr. Hunter here, our superintendent um, with the CPAC Appreciation Awards um, for the effort and dedication they've shown this year to special education in the district. As Casey said, we really appreciate it. Um, and so, um, yeah, just I guess the main thing with the Appreciation Awards is they give us um, and the families a chance to reflect on the school year recognize the staff members in our districts who have gone above and beyond in their efforts to support our students. Um, they are wonderful. Uh, we just really are so grateful. Um, one other thing I want to highlight from that event, um, and I know some, some people in this room were in attendance. Um, it was really well attended, actually. And I think part of that, you know, is partially, wow, we can all be together again indoors. And it's it's wonderful. It's so nice to see people and, and people are smiling and there's a positive energy. Um, but it was also great that the, you know, so many members of the administration came out, um, the building principals were there supporting their staff to show their appreciation for the staff who are doing this work in their schools too. Um, so we really appreciated that as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we held a number of events this year. Um, our uh, events chair, Chris Streeter Tarlow was managing those. Um, we had a number of um, virtual workshops in November. We had Tracy Morgan from the Federation for Children with Special Needs present um, an IEP basic rights um, workshop, which they uh, present yearly, or they're able to present yearly to CPACs that requested um, basic rights of evaluation and eligibility for IEPs. Um, in February, as Casey mentioned, we had our um, informal Zooms with the special ed coordinators um, at each school level. Uh, in March, Sarah Ward um, did an outstanding presentation on the executive function. Um, and for that one, uh, the Concord and Carlisle um, CPAC had collaborated with four other districts to split the cost. Um, it was really well attended. Um, it says over here over 150 people joined. I believe it. I don't even remember how many were on. I was on. It was really awesome. Um, really good. And then um, just, uh, well, I guess it's June now. So say just a few weeks ago, but literally May 3rd. <laughs> Sarah Gannon from Crafting Minds um, spoke about early literacy and um, evidence-based instruction for early readers. Um, and then throughout the year, we also had a number of parent coffees. We basically, we get together usually at Rideout Playground with a box of Joe and some munchkins and just a nice informal way for um, parents to come meet each other, um, mm -hmm. ask questions of one another, just kind of get to know each other. We have a really great um, network and supportive um, group of parents here in Concord with our kids in the district that are on um, IEPs and 504 plans. So those are great and we'll, we'll definitely keep doing those. And uh, next slide, please, that might be the last one. Oh no, one more. We also um, did a lot more with our social media this year. Um, our social media chair, Megan Carroll, did a phenomenal job, um, kind of just increasing our presence across social media platforms. Um, it's obviously a really important method, but especially since I think COVID, it's more and more people are just looking to that. That's how they get their information about when's a meeting happening, when's an event happening. Um, so we've had a lot of stuff on there, um, you know, the events and updates, but also articles, resources. Um, she's been great with that. And all the board members are able to post on those. So we get a lot of good content on there. Next slide. Um, and I know as Casey kind of mentioned to just sort of our participation and um, a lot of things going on in the district, the PTG um, presidents meetings, um, the schools themselves, their PTGs meetings, um, we've had attendance at 
school committee, um, finance committee, other relevant town committee meetings. And just, um, it's been great to be sort of welcome there and, and let everyone know um, that we're there wanting to collaborate, it's been great. Um, and then um, also Casey touched on our outreach with our um, proposed expansion for the at-large board positions, um, really looking to, you know, reach out to more families, especially in the um, areas or districts um, that have been less included on the board before, let them know that we really want to invite them in and be part of our um, part of our process here. Um, and so we'll have expanded liaison positions. Um, we have initiated outreach to METCO, METCO Families Collective and the COAR. And we, again, are anticipating um, Eva Mustafi from Carlisle, um, who you all know is so wonderful to um, hopefully join our board. And I think that's all for me. So <laughs> thank you. Please advance the slide. Engagement with the middle school project. This was a hot topic for the CPAC this year. At the uh, front end of the year, Dr. Hunter and Principal Cameron from CMS presented a design and programming plans for the new middle school um, at one of our board, board meetings. We also were part of sending a letter of support for the inclusion of this center for human-centered design to the CMS building committee. We did have a late request to the CMS building committee, to rather to the select board to have a seat added due to the size of the building committee. I think it's probably like a, you know, you have like an NFL team size. It's almost as big as that. Um, it was deemed that that probably wasn't a great idea at this point. But then again, this goes back to the collaboration between the school committee and the administration. We have regrouped to look at ways that we can partner together. Uh, looking towards planning on hosting a building design forum in the summer to collect input from our families in the greater community and to continue that collaborative dialogue as the project moves forward. This is a project that's near and dear to our hearts because so much of it includes bringing programming for our students into the middle school where it hasn't previously been. And that is reflective in the design. It's in how the spaces are made. It's how they look. It's how the sound is amplified. It's how they how it looks to be pulled out of a classroom rather than pushed into a classroom. So we are really grateful for that. And we look forward to continuing that dialogue and sharing more information with our parents. Please advance the slide. We were fortunate to be part of and very grateful to be part of the district's um, diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic planning committee. Uh, I serve as a representative for CPAC on that committee, and it has really been a tremendous educational opportunity for myself, and it allows me to better uh, not just voice where the CPAC is coming from, in these DEI conversations, but learning more for us to take back to our own membership, to how we form our board. As uh, Ashley was mentioning, we are proposing, and she'll get to bylaws in a moment. I, I know bylaws are a great way to keep the <laughs> oxygen flowing. I, it, they're great. Um, part of what we're looking to do with our board is to have intentional representation with our at-large seats. We currently have three at-large seats, but they are not designated. We want to make sure that we have a Concord designated seat, a Boston designated seat, and a Carlisle designated seat. There is some discussion in this process to have a fourth designated seat, and we will be going through these bylaws later on in the month. Um, we also, I don't wanna skip over the fact that um, DEI Director Andrew Namichi and, and Debbie Dixon from uh, the Interim Student Services Director did a focus group with our families uh, for collecting information for the DEI Strategic Planning Committee. Um, and I've already gone over the bottom piece, so you may please advance the slide. Last, but certainly not least, literacy and dyslexia guidelines and practices. This is a particular area of interest for our membership. And we were uh, we formed a subcommittee to go over a couple of key initiatives that were the priority for us. Early and proactive identification of dyslexia, educational alignment across all tiers of instruction, teacher training and certification, ensuring that educators are officially trained and certified and updating a teacher training database annually increase ELA achievement for all students with disabilities. 
again, I want to go back to the principal reports. I know it, it, I will admit I did check my phone at one point, so I wasn't tuned in totally. My apologies, Principal Mistrullo. Um, thank you. Um, <laughs> certainly each of the elementary schools and Mr. Cameron at the middle school mentioned literacy and reading in their presentations. They weren't coached for that. I'm certain that is something that is genuine coming out of the priorities for their schools. And it's a testament to our voices being heard. Our students who are, who have um, uh, ELA, or sorry, our students who, I'm, I'm not even gonna use the correct language. Kristen, help me see. This is, a, I'm like calling for a helpline here. Our dyslexic students, but also our, our students who struggle with literacy. And um, they are, they are some of our biggest population of students with disabilities. And we look forward to continuing a specific dialogue around this area. After the presentation, the MTSS presentation, which again was collaborative, was expansive and very, very informative. We're hoping to see more information be available on the district's website for families to be able to understand what that screening process looks like, to be able to understand what they should be looking for and what role they play in the process and where the thresholds are in terms of gaining services. So we look forward to coordinating further with the district on that. Please advance the slide. This is the bylaws. This is where it gets really good. <laughs> That's why I get to do this part. <laughs> I can take the hate. <laughs> um, it's actually pretty um, pretty brief, I promise. So we, we did, um, as a board, vote in February to update our bylaws to remove um, some of the references to open meeting law, um, given guidance from the AG's office saying that CPAC is not bound by those laws. Um, I don't have to tell all of you um, <laughs> what they what they entail. They're quite, um, they can be quite onerous, especially for a small group like ours where the membership is kind of constantly changing. So we did remove that um, and we just sort of clarified our membership membership structure, um, added the virtual meeting option because that is important, um, it makes our meetings a lot more accessible we've found and added the um, at, large, at large board members. And now as Casey mentioned, we are going to um, re be revisiting that over the summer to, um, to designate um, and be more intentional with you know, trying to get those um, at large seats for um, Concord, Carlisle, and ELL and Boston. Um, so that's what we're doing with those. Thank you. Please advance the slide. All right, the final slide. Looking ahead, we are going to be focusing in the year to come on increasing our family engagement. So this is looking at updating our website to really have more robust information for families and resources, whether it's from summer camps or places to go get outside occupational therapy evaluations. We're looking to have more of our events and we're very pleased to partner with the administration who helps fund many of our events. Obviously, we want to continue the collaboration and continue the Debbie Dixon standard going forward. Um, and we are looking forward to participating in the hiring committee for the new director of student services when that comes. We're looking forward to the continued and enhanced participation and ongoing communication regarding the new middle school building to our families. And we are also looking to enhance our outreach to all of our membership, most especially our members, most historically marginalized from historically marginalized communities. We wanna to continue to be part of the uh, district's diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, strategic planning committee and be an active and collaborative member on that. We will continue to advocate for budgetary support for special education programs, continue the dialogue on district-wide dyslexia and literacy programs and supports. And finally, we understand that old habits are hard to go away but we respectfully propose that the administration and school committee refer to the district student population as pre-K through 22 rather than K through 12. This more accurately represents our student populations, mm -hmm. but it also language means something. 
And I do want to highlight in my closing remarks, how awesome our preschool is mm -hmm. <laughs> and how awesome our programs are that close out our students who are here with us through the age of 22. We'd like to also thank you, our previous, thank our previous board members who worked so hard in the previous years to build us where we are today. And thank all of you for listening to this presentation, number one, but being active collaborators and partners in this. We deeply appreciate it and we look forward to more to come. Thank you. Thank you very nice. Thank, thank you guys so much. much. Yeah. Um, I am really grateful for such a comprehensive presentation. Um, you know I don't have questions because I've been with you for this ride all year, but if anyone else has any comments or present or questions on the CPAC presentation, I'd entertain them now. Very comprehensive, incredibly good, very detailed. <laughs> don't leave much room for question. <laughs> we, we were deeply impressed with the award ceremony. Uh, and we thank you for, for your you know, participation that I should note that also a lot of the building administrators were there even if they weren't nominated and they were there to support their staff it was a really beautiful thing to see very nice Thank and you so I don't one more thing I don't think it's a coincidence that you had 116 um you know people nominated I think that you've done incredible outreach this year to families and that is definitely showing so people are being actively engaged in the process so I appreciate that Appreciate that, Chair Morano. I will say that that's more of a reflection on the educators themselves and administrators and building staff. So I would I would turn that around. That's really reflective on them. But thank you. I love this notion of um, pre-K through 22. I think that's. I mean, we all talk about being an inclusive community, and that's certainly um, an easy way to do it, but hard to retrain, like you said, how we talk about your student body vision. It's true in, in the preschool. So Ann Bailey, our six time award winner <laughs> is a mainstay at the preschool. The preschool is just down the hall here. If you haven't been there, I highly recommend you go there. They, uh, they work wonders. Both of my kids went through there and, and they're one of the reasons why they're still in the district today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you guys you. so much. Thank you. Have a good night. All right, um, we are moving on to international travel and you should have received the memo from Dr. Hunter outlining some of the trips that the high school teachers are hoping to plan for next year. And really what we're looking for is just some consensus to give um, Mr. Mastrullo and the teachers and the district the ability to start planning. Yeah, I'm actually going to invite Mike back up if he'll come sit with me. And just to highlight a few, and partially I want to spend just a minute because the last time we had this conversation of international travel was winter of 2020. It had been a very uh, lengthy discussion among the school committee at the time. And then ironically, everything stopped. And despite all that preparation and conversation, no one went anywhere. So just to note some of the pieces that we know we're still on the discussion table at that point, and also forward thinking of where we're trying to go. Uh, we did collect from the staff whether they're interested in going. I think most of those, if you've been on the committee a little while, will recognize familiar places and names. So that's the early draft of tentative trips. Please also note some of them are exchanges, which means kids will come here as well. And they operate a little bit differently in that usually we're sending kids to stay with um, families in these other places or, uh, or work with another school in terms of where the um, a hospitality is being hosted rather than a packaged trip. And that does matter in terms of the planning process. Um, so I just wanted to outline all of those. The earliest we're considering it all would be February of, of next winter into April. Um, Q5 had been a portion of this. We are not planning a Q5 for next year, but for the the spring of 24, we need a year to get our bearings back. Um, so the end of year might not be as open and available as it had been in 2018 and 19. Um, ideas and things we know we need to talk about that we don't have the answers to yet, which is why we're just asking for planning approval, not bringing you the actual trips, which I've highlighted here, just getting more systemic about our approach. I met with all the teachers, Mike has also been part of that. So we're talking with all of them at once and not just one trip at a time, which they really appreciated. I have to say they were thrilled by that. 
Um, getting all that to the school webpage, which already exists. It just needs a refresh. Um, arrangement of uh, travel insurance. I still have scars from trying to get money back from some of these companies in 2020. Um, so we're gonna be way ahead of that because we know COVID as would be the next item is going to impact if people can't go, if a trip gets postponed, et cetera, all the various um, new things we have to consider. Uh, arrangement for fundraising, and this is the money part, which we talked a lot about three years ago. A couple of ideas that were floating is that everyone participated in some fundraising, op fundraising opportunity. It will not necessarily cover the cost of these trips, which can be thousands of dollars, but at least to subsidize. And then the Sharon Young Fund, which is a fund that was established when our, one of our elementary principals retired a few years ago, and there's 20 some thousand in that account that never got spent. Rein, reinstating that committee in the process so that we can actually utilize those funds through a process that makes sense. Um, not just Mike and I figuring out who's gonna get it, but a collective group. So more to come on a proposal for that. And then the staff, this came from them, was really talking through individual student needs traveling abroad. Um, and I'm sure Mike would agree, he's managed medical and mental health issues from here when they're in Japan and Europe and very tricky stuff. So we like to be more proactive. So with your blessing, we'd like approval to plan and then bring you formal proposal of trip proposals in the fall with all the details, dates, locations, costs, et cetera, as, long, as well as those processes fleshed out. So that's what we're hoping for tonight is blessing to go forward. Okay. Um, any questions for Ms. Mistrula, Dr. Hunter, comments? I don't know how many kids participate in each, program, like in each travel or and how many collectively does that add up? Does that matter? Sure, it depends. Yeah, I mean, it varies. So um, some of the trips, like uh, an Iceland trip might have, you know, 30, 40 kids where some of the exchanges are smaller, um, you know, roughly 15 or so. Um, so the, it's been a while. The aggregate, I mean, you could have, you know, over the course of two years, 100 students traveling. So, you know, it's pretty substantial. There's a long history in the district of the exchange programs, Nye being at the top of that list, which you know we are, we just passed 25 years, and um, you know I'm a big believer in the opportunity for kids to to travel, and I think the the, the programs that we offer, um, you know, not all travel has meaning, but uh, you know some of it's particularly the exchanges uh, had great value in you know long term lasting friendships and, and relationships. But also just, um, you know, not necessarily just blowing through museums, so to speak, but more of um, trips with an educational purpose, whether it's service or, you know, environmental, whatever it might be. So it's, a, it's an impressive list and it'd be great to get back to, to offering it for sure. Mike, uh, do we know if Nanai might be actually an exchange? Because we do have principal contacts over there, I know. Yeah. Um, and I'm imagining that's still a potential, but we don't know. It, it certainly is a potential. There is turnover there quite a bit with, you know, when, uh, and I don't know if you're speaking of a building principal or just principal as no, a building general principal. sense. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely turnover in that area. Um, and so, you know, there have been efforts to kind of maintain that relationship. It's, it has proved challenging. Even some of the ideas we had about, how do we maintain this during COVID, whether it's, you know, a, a, a writing exercise or Zoom, or, and then we have time zone limitations. And so um, it does uh, represent some challenges. However, we're fully committed to it. We do have David Gresco is a, is a stipend advisor to and I. We do work with folks in the community that are still in contact uh, with folks in and I. So it would be great for that to be an exchange. I, I will say that where the other ones tends to be a little more manageable because we're talking about 15 kids and usually when we're doing the night trip it, it's it's very large which right. which is great but obviously yeah, a lot more planning is needed if i could use this opportunity um a week from tomorrow night the concord and i group is doing a fundraiser at barrels if anybody's interested um and uh the the new community liaison from Concord to Nanai is a CCHS grad. Um, that whole thing was suspended, as you know, mm -hmm. because of COVID, but um, he's heading over there, I think, in the next month. Yeah, oh. and, and Sue Curtin deserves a, a lot of credit here, here, for, here. Yeah, for sure. just maintaining, keeping Nanai in the forefront of our minds. And um, yeah, it'd be great to, to 
just kind of go back to actually doing it instead of talking about it. Great. Well, I, I cannot underscore the benefits of international travel myself. I um, haven't had a passport since high school because I went on a school trip in high school. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think about that and it is an opportunity for some kids that they may never travel again internationally. So, you know, I'm fully in support of it. I think that we should just maybe just take a consensus. We in support of um, Chris Mastrillo, Dr. Hunter, and the team of teachers to just move forward and start the planning process. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. And definitely thank your teachers for going with the students because yeah, that is a huge lift for them. Yes, they get to travel. They're an enthusiastic bunch, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So thank you. Would you like me to just reference these other two trips yes. that we're asking yes. you to consider? These are athletic trips, which uh, we actually, you, the committee did approve them a year ago, and then um, both of them attempted to go out and COVID got in the way. Um, so this is first discussion. You would vote this next week. We're trying to get our old practices back. Uh, so the first is for the football team to go to the camp in Maine at the end of August for a few nights. We, we know a lot more than we did a year ago when we went, when we thought they were going to go and then COVID snuck up right before the trip and we know a lot more. So that's great news. And then the second one is the girls soccer team, their annual trip to New Hampshire, which is right at the beginning of September. Same idea. I think we've got a much better handle on, well, first of all, a lot more vaccines and testing and all of that, but I think we've also got ways to manage it that um, can be really successful to separate kids and keep the rest of the trip intact, knowing we can test and maintain that. So yeah. um, we'd like you to think about approving that next week and we could take any questions between now and then. Okay. All right, so moving down to superintendent evaluation. Um, this is on the agenda. DESE has new guidance. Uh, well, actually it's from 2019, but now recommends a two year re evaluation cycle for experienced superintendents. I'm happy to say that Dr. Hunter falls into that category of an experienced superintendent, which um, they define as three or more years of experience. And as you know, she is finishing her fifth year at the district. So we would like to propose the committee that um, the DESE, Per the DESI guidance, we evaluate Dr. Hunter every two years. So the discussion tonight will be um, a little bit of discussion, then we'll vote on that at our next meeting. So it would mean we evaluated her last year, so we will not evaluate her this year and then evaluate her next year. So that is up for discussion right now. Anyone has any comments? Good. Okay, great. So, so that will go right on the agenda as an action item, item next June week. 14th. Um, all right. And then our school committee self-evaluation. Sort of the same thing. Um, in preparing for my role as chair, I was um, doing a lot of uh, <clears throat> research at the MASC and the tools and whatnot that they have to offer. And what I learned is that, you know, Per our own policies and our own handbook, we engage in, a, in an annual self-evaluation. Um, and the MASC actually provides a suite of tools to do that. And what I thought was nice about um, what the MASC does is that they facilitate it for us, meaning a couple things. One, they aggregate the data for us. So it takes everything off of our plate. Um, you know, in a quite literal way. Um, it also allows us to have some more anonymity and, you know, frees us up to sort of maybe be a little freer in what we say. I don't know if that's been an issue in the past, but it does allow us to do that. So um, we have, I've engaged with Dorothy, who is our representative. She recommended um, that she would bring in a partner to do this work with her. She's recommending for several reasons, mostly to be honest, based on availability. Um, Jim Hardy, we would, um, the process is that you, everyone on the committee, um, except for Lucky Sharon, who I've, <laughs> who I've talked with already, um, will receive from Dorothy um, an electronic version of the survey. The data is collected by a plat the platform they use is SurveyMonkey. Um, 
data would be collected and aggregated by um, Dorothy Presser. Uh, data would be synthesized together by her and Jim. And then we would, it would be brought to us um, with their sort of analysis, their recommendations. Um, and the idea is like all self-evaluations, um, it would help us and, you know, inform, you know, what we adopt for best practices um, would help us set our goals for September. Um, the trickiest part is going to be our scheduling. Erin um, did collect um, data from all of us about our availability. We've cross-referenced that um, with Dorothy's and um, I think we are going to be able to squeeze it in July provided. Um, I'll just be honest, I fly back from a vacation for a day, which is fine. Um, so otherwise we wouldn't be able to really do it till September and that's when we want to set our goals. So um, that's what I'm going to propose um, and hope we can get that started soon. So quick Any question. questions? So the self-eval is online, but the Dorothy is, she physically joins us to present findings is what I'm yeah. guessing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It removes the data aggregation and even, I guess, some of the analysis from the plate really of the chairs um, so that it's done independently by the facilitators at the MASC. And this is common practice for the MASC. They do these types of things frequently. So this is not, you know, something new. And do they tend to, do they recommend doing it in the summer, like when a committee yes. just formed? Or, I mean, because like, this, you know, this is like we're under a view. Yeah, this, we're right. going to. Because there could be an argument for doing it in like January. When yeah. kind of so yeah, it. no, Dorothy was, they want us to, generally they do it in advance of full setting. So as we do that in September, this is a perfect time. And generally they do do it in the slower months of the summer when there can be time dedicated to it. So she actually said summer was sort of the perfect time for us. Cynthia. So I love doing self-evaluation. I feel like our committee has done extensive work already reflecting on our year. And I would very much like to move this to January to actually dipstick on what initiatives we're putting in place right now. Right? Okay. I, I don't think it's a good thing to look back on this past year, to be totally honest, at this point. I don't think it's productive. And I think it's much more productive for us to move forward and invest in what we want to do moving forward. And then look at how successful we've been at that in six months from now. Well, I think this will be an annual process. So we would do this. But I'm, kind I'm of saying we're kind again. of at a juncture. What? We're kind of at a, at, at a juncture, right? As a committee, we're putting to we're trying to do a lot of new things, which is great. And I think we just need to move forward right now. And we did have discussion with Dorothy, and this is her recommendation for us. As a well, we didn't have discussion. No, you, we haven't had it. We yes. did, right. We right. haven't discussed this, and it's, yeah. No, exactly. Well, my, my question would be, is, is Dorothy aware of the very special circumstances that have these very special workshops that are so highly unusual? And we'd be doing a, we're just trying to stop time and do an eval during this active, unusual process of, workshops uh, well aware of that sure. context? she was she articulated that um none of their workshops whether they're a, this kind of self-evaluation or some of the ones that they list um under different governance categories are really prescribed meaning they're always customized and kind of bespoke if you will for every committee that they work with so given that um, you know, some of the work we want to do is about, um, I think, adopting best practices. Um, uh, like to your point, Cynthia, looking up for a vision forward, um, and for again, a really great way to provide consensus about goal setting. I do think it would it would behoove us to do some self reflection so that we can sort of all have consensus about, you know, identifying, <clears throat> oh, wow, we're really good at these three things. Oh, we're meh, mediocre at these things. And we're kind of rotten at these kinds of things. And I think all of those categories would be present, frankly, in any school committee. Um, no school committee is going to be entirely great or entirely awful. And I think 
the more we can identify um, our strengths and weaknesses as we cut into our goal setting phase, I, I think that is going to, to be in our best interest. Yes, and yes. again, it also is our policy. We have to do this anyway. Yeah, we, 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 there's many, I mean, we, we don't comply with every policy. We could certainly make an exception and vote as a committee not to do something. Sure, um, I suppose yeah. we could vote as a committee. Were, sure. were the chairs to want us to move ahead? Do the chairs also want to weave the findings of this self eval into these special workshops anticipated for this summer? What special workshops it, are we doing? Uh, I thought we were working with uh, Mr. Evans in some capacity. I think this would be. I could see I, I some of the work intersecting. The sure. And, you know, what um, you plan yeah, I could vision? see some of the work intersecting. But again, my feel, you know, my thought process was this is a wonderful way to get some sort of foundational knowledge of sort of where we are. Um, you know, I don't think it needs to be, um, you know, again, this is, I think, what the best practice of what a good school committee would do anyway. Um, personally, I love the idea that they would, you know, help us. I think an independent third party coming in to really do that analysis would be helpful. Um, and I, and again, I, as we look towards goal setting, I think it would be helpful. Well, we I, just, don't, I don't have any issue yeah, with that. I, I, just, so. thought, I like, just thought the timing was questions, questions that we answered questions. last year, right? Last year, we just sort of took the process and made it into those five reflections, yeah. right? Look back on the last year. What are you proud of? What did you miss? Right. Like, what do you hope for this year? Blah, whatever, right? What do you bring to the table or whatever, right? Those were our, and, yeah. and we referenced the, the 35 page document that the NASC yeah. has. Yeah, so initially we had but the so the survey monkey, but that just takes me to my question. The survey monkey thing is that you because one of the things that you circulated was like a 15 page yep. thing. Is that the survey monkey? No. Oh, so okay. I apologize. So so, so when I embarked on this should process, we see the survey monkey. <laughs> yeah. No. So when I embarked on this process, it really was organic. I'm I'm fishing around on you know seeing what sort of tools they have to offer us as we're going into summer, which again I think is a lot of the times, at least from what I'm learning of Dorothy, is when the school committees engage in this type of work, when there isn't the business of the school committee, if you will, that kind of gets in the way, this can sort of be the focus. Um, I initially stumbled on the initial document that I distributed to you or maybe was attached in the agenda. Um, at that time, I said to Dorothy, you know, if, if we move ahead with this, we're gonna need to have some dates, um, would, you know, could we start talking about that? At which point she said, hmm, that's an older version of what we recommend. This newer one we think is better. It's what you know, we're using. You know, again, they have several tools that I'm sure they modify and refine over time. And she was the one that brought this, you know, it, it is it's robust. Um, uh, this robust evaluation. And she said that's this is the one we're recommending to school committees now, and there are many school committees who use this as their annual tool. But this is the, so the second- The second, second one, one yes. is the survey. Yes, and it is in a PDF version, so just so that we can yeah, yeah, attach it to the agenda, that. obviously. Yeah. And then, so it's it's a, that's a lot of work to even fill that out. Yes, but okay, the good that's news what I'm is that okay. so then we're, not getting in a, we're not getting in a workshop anytime soon, so we will have a long time. Um, no, no, it's still it's time. You know, we've all devoted a lot of time over the last three or four months to sure. the school committee. I mean, it, 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 50 to 70 hours, I'm not even exaggerating, right? Um, and then how much time have we spend synthesizing this historic? So so we don't- No, 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 I mean, what's yeah. working with um, How long is the workshop? I, you know, I'm not sure. I, I would is expect probably two hours. hours. It's one, it's that that one workshop. workshop. Okay, because I think we need another workshop. That's what I'm trying to get at, not yeah. just talking about the survey, sure. going through a lot of other stuff as a school committee. Right. And I, and I think that our feeling was we, you know, in our discussion with Dorothy is the only way to really understand how we're working together as a committee and, and going up best practices is really to drill down in every area that's in that survey and, and just start afresh and have somebody else help us to move forward in a productive way. I mean, that's, that was really our intention to see where we're at. And, and this has everything to do also with just school committee relations with each other, with, you know, it, it has, it encompasses a lot of information. 
And so I think it's really the best way to really reflect on how we can be the best committee we can be and best practices. And MASC is our, our guide for what are best practices out there for school committees. And we can decide, you know, we want to do it or we don't want to do it, but they are the governing body that helps school committees. And that's why we look to the MASC. I just, yeah, I, I understand the concept. It's just, we are at a very odd place as a committee, right? And I just think that looking back, I think you're going to get a very wide, you know, it's just going to show. But I think that will help, don't you think? Like, um, I mean, to me, I, I think. I don't know. I really don't know. We'll share and participate in what way. That's the other thing. I, Sharon is not participating. I understand, in but then in the process at all, but she could join she us will, for the workshop. Yeah, she could be invited to join the I join so. the workshop. I mean, yes, yeah, so that, that would be part of the goal setting. But she, right. we're not burdening her with. Well, she can't, and yeah. I even find it hard. I think for yeah. for yeah. Carrie to fill it out. I, I think it should be somebody who's been here at least six months. Well, I, I have to say, last year I did actually fill it out, and I felt very uncomfortable doing well, that it. That was a little tiny thing. Right, but yeah. I felt very uncomfortable doing it. I still filled it out and I, I gave my perspective more, I guess more so as a parent, you know, and it, it was, you know, and it was all I could do. So I totally understand that. And I think the workshopping process, so after we do the evaluation, you know, I mean, Carrie's been with us since, I don't know, March. Well, it, it, it's then. been a, quite a raucous three months, let's be honest, right? I understand that. Been but, normal. I mean, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. but we need yes. to move forward and this is well, what of we course consider I want to move our forward, best. And that's, I'm not, no, I'm, not, I'm not hearing anybody debate the no. wisdom of uh, evaluation. But I, I also Nobody's think debating too. that at all. Yeah. I just at timing, I don't think it's this optimal. That's, that's just my but I also think, too, you know, this is not some special one, you know, yeah. some special thing. This is something, this is a document that a lot of school committees use every year. No, but we're there's not nothing every special year, about it. Let's, yeah, we're not every year place as a school committee. It makes sense to like I like I wouldn't our, know like pulling this out for example like I wouldn't know like am I filling it out based on how we're operating like I would talk like right now as we are this is where we stand right that's where that you know like you know like the the practices I would say they're in the current like at, as it's as the protocols are going now right. Is, I, I need a big, I need to figure out how what's okay. So Dorothy can yeah. take us through exactly how she'd like us to answer it because I do think that what we're getting into is we need an objective third party yep. to give it to us, tell us how to fill it out. We will fill it out. Good. And then okay. she can get all the information together and then we'll workshop it. And that's our intention with the self-avow, but it is per our policies that we do evaluate. This committee and and I understand that we've had a rocky you know few months, but this is part of our responsibility to you know the public. Really. Okay, if, if we could just get a clarification, because I, I like Sarah, I would say the way things are today, I wouldn't try to say, well, let's be, let's fill it out based on January or February or. Well, whatever. it is a look back. It is a look back and evaluation of the year, but but we'll have Dorothy meet with us and she can talk to us about that. And the most effective way to do it, because I, I do think that MASC is our guide. They are who help school boards through challenging times, through great times. I mean, they are, she's our field rep and she can bring us through that. So she'll come to, that's the thing. I, I need to have us all talk to her together about right. this. Yeah, okay. we can so, do that. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah. We can do that. So maybe we can just see if she can come to our June 14th meeting yep. and join us for part of that. And so we'll just put it, we'll put it on our June 14th um, That'd be good. agenda yep. and she can talk to us about it and then you can, you know, ask questions, but that's where we're at with the evaluation at this point. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All right. So piggybacking on. Is there, is there on a specific then. Dorothy date that we should hold on to for the summer? You said you had. Sorry, can you say uh, Dorothy Day for the oh. summer. <laughs> um, it's it, it's got to be dependent on me on yeah. when I can do it. I think the only times um, that work for everyone on this committee and Dorothy are times when I'm away. So I just have to look, break the news to my husband, talk to Dorothy when the best date for her will be, because I know all of you are available. So um, give me a little time to do that. No problem. Yeah, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Sorry about that. 
All right, you're up next. Okay, right? and I'm up. Yeah. So uh, we wanted to put on um, the agenda just uh, to keep the, the greater public informed and to um, demonstrate our progress moving forward that um, I just wanted to provide an update that we have um, engaged with um, a facilitator that will assist the school committee um, in developing norms for interactions and communications between and among members of our own committee, um, between and among members of the superintendent, um, and to uh, hope that this um, work will be completed by August 15th. I think if we're all being honest, that is gonna be aspirational um, considering our schedules now that Aaron has um, collected that data. So um, I think we're gonna probably, that work will commence over the summer. Um, we do have a workshop scheduled um, for the 16th, which you guys all know about. Um, and then some of the more ongoing work involving norms and protocols uh, will happen over the summer, but likely will get pushed um, at least a little bit into early September when we all return. Um, more to come on that um, once I get um, everyone's, once I again, look more at everyone's availability. Not with the three <laughs> for summer, so. Do we get a final time and location for 16? Uh, we are working on that. I think we're gonna hold it here. Um, and this time is 6.30 p.m. I think I referenced that in an email to 6 you. 6.30 to 9.30, I think. Okay, I think you got that. Maybe another location might be good. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. That. Another location. Well, I think we're, we have challenges even getting into rooms of other locations. Really? So okay. we want to just make it as easy as possible. <laughs> just it's after hours. I think it's okay. Yeah. What? Okay. So um, it's six thirty. Six thirty. Yes. Yes. To nine thirty. Okay. Three hours. Okay, so in more exciting news, um, next up we have the Metco School Committee Representatives Policy. And Erin, if you could um, pull that up on the screen, that would be great. And Court, I know you weren't here at the last meeting, and um, this is our second read. And if you know, feel free to chime in. <laughs> no, I'm, feel I'm, like. I'm, I'm aware of the changes that. Yeah. Uh, have been uh, adopted thus far. Thank you. Okay, so we made some changes at our last meeting, and then we actually, um, Cynthia made a good catch in that first line, um, and the only addition here is the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committee. Um, we stated it in the title, but we just missed it in that first line, so if, if anyone else has any changes or additions or anything you've caught in the past two weeks, Catch anything? <laughs> Are we good? <laughs> I think I think we're in great shape here. But again, we're going to revisit this. Um, we can revisit it at any time. If if anyone has any additions or feedback, we try to include all of the necessary legal references at the bottom. And certainly, if anything else comes up, we will revisit it. Any other comments or discussion? No, I think it represents uh, a lot of interest being spoken to in the fullest way we can at this point. Um, I guess given the CPAC presentation tonight, the only thing I might want, well, pre-K doesn't affect Metco, Metco, I the same and thing that was the only thing I was thinking, but, um, Okay, so we're all set there. We can say kindergarten to 12th grade, or should we put kindergarten to 22? We don't. We don't. We don't have, have, have that. Yeah. yeah. Right. What it says right now is accurate exactly. to where most okay. students yeah. right. are. So I think you can could that. be fluid okay. with that. It's, yeah. If it changes, it's accurate if it changes, we, we could update yeah. it. Okay, yeah. perfect. I just wanted to be aware. Okay, so if there's no further discussion on that, we will see that in a vote tonight. Um, 
And now I'm going to give it to Lori for the regional FY22 budget. And you all should have received a memo um, from Dr. Hunter on that. Thank you. And Ian Rames is on Zoom, so he can be available to us as questions might come up. So in terms of where we are uh, for the end of year status, FY22 with the regional budget, uh, right now we have an uncommitted balance of $733,000. We need $300,000 towards E&D because of how that's the revenue stream that's built into the FY23 budget. Um, the business office is estimating we want to hold 200,000 or so to get through the close and end of year commitments that are coming up and unencumbered. And that would leave us a balance of 233,000 uncommitted. So essentially that's quote unquote, your surplus projection for tonight. Um, I do note here that we uh, did do recommend in our planning on pre-purchasing again, the ninth grade laptops, and that would allow us to stay on cycle. And it also maintains the budget processes we've been building in the past. We can talk about that in the FY23 build if you'd like. Uh, we gave you status on revolving accounts because in some places they're connected and others we just knew you would want the information. The athletic account started with 304,000 is going to end with about 300,000. So that's a pretty, pretty much a, an inflow and in expense and revenue cost that's equating to each other. So that gives me comfort that the athletic fees are sound. It does mean that really the COVID savings that piled in there are remaining and could be available to you for, for other options in the future, including the turf field. Food service does need to be self-funding. There's no one anywhere who has exactly achieved that in COVID. Um, so that needs to be the goal for FY23. We right now are looking to need to subsidize that sum. We're gonna have actual revenue numbers from the federal government the, the, the totals firm up after you stop serving lunch. So we need to finish school, get into next week, and within a week or so, we'll have those solidly in hand. So once we know that, we can look at what offset we need to contribute. And really the discussion as we get word from the state, there's a lot of politicking going on right now in Massachusetts. The, the federal government is not providing universal free lunch anymore, but all the states are each talking about it, including Massachusetts. So. We're in a little bit of a holding pattern while we wait to see which direction they go. We had been planning on expecting to charge again, uh, but we'll see where that lands. We do need to get to where it's a self-sustaining program. That's, that's a given. Uh, in terms of circuit breaker, we have uh, carried over uh, the entire amount. And so we're going to have unspent contingency there, which is a good positive thing to have that as, as flush as possible. In terms of the recommendation for tonight, uh, to look at the official vote to prepay special ed tuitions to the collaboratives, which we're allowed by law to do and you have been doing annually, very typical of uh, the close of a school budget. So we're recommending $300,000 and we could talk on a remaining balance of 22 if you decide to look at how to work with the surplus first. And so that's the surplus discussion um, our recommendation right now is to take 200,000 of that surplus and um, allocate it again to this capital, the regional, let me be sure we're clear on which fund, capital uh, stabilization fund that is overseen by the region and within our purview. Um, because a couple of moving pieces are there, the September 6th vote on in Concord for the paving project, it's looking the more Russ has spent time with the folks involved, it's looked like that's gonna push it out almost a year probably. Uh, we can't get it to work with the timing of the weather and the bids and the vacations and all that, it's not coming together. That could, it could or it could not have additional costs. It would be moderate, I'm sure, but if you had funds available, you should be able to manage whatever variance is there. And the turf we know continues to be on our radar to need to talk about that. So the vote on tonight is for the um, prepayment of the collaborative tuitions of $300,000. What I'd like to do is get feedback from you if you'd like to consider the stabilization allocation, then we can get the language together to vote that like we did a year ago. But I didn't want to put that, I didn't want to make that assumption for you. I wanted to get direction for next week. Okay. So that's where we are. Okay. Um. Cynthia? So I'll say as somebody who's been out here for four years, this is a little confusing. 
for two new members. So sure. I'm having a hard time even following it. So, and I mean, not because it wasn't well presented, it is complicated. It's complicated. You know, it is really complicated. So, I mean, maybe for next week, I'm happy to vote tonight. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I don't dispute any numbers or anything like that. But because I think the hard thing I have wrapped, to wrap my head around is you have a surplus and then we're doing, you know, the laptop prepays, we're doing the 100,000 in the um, food service budget we're doing. So that's coming out of the budget before the surplus. Is that correct? Yes, we okay. made an assumption we would need a hundred thousand. Right. So service. if, if right. so, if you could just—I mean, I guess I could look. So it's the laptops are out of the budget before the surplus. The hundred thousand dollars for the uh, food services out of the budget before the surplus. What else was there? Was there something else? I think those are the two big I ones. I think those are the ones. And yeah. then, uh, and the then two hundred thousand to close twenty-two out. Right. And then the tuitions are before the surplus or after. That's part of the surplus that we're using. No, that Ian, do you want to clarify for us? Yeah, so the 233 so, is after the prepay, right? No, no, the, the 233 does not have the prepay included. So we didn't assume that that was going to be um, done or not. So it, it'll, it's um, it's still up for debate, I guess. If we prepay, that's going to lower the surplus. But we also have, we could have um, closeouts and things like that that increase it. So. Um, but isn't the 233 after the 300,000 in prepay, Ian? No, uh, no, it's not, no. Can you clarify that for us then? Yeah, so if we did the prepay, that would, if we did the prepay for the full 300,000, that would eat up most of our um, available excess funds. So if, if we did the stabilization, we would only be able to prepay up to a certain amount. So if we did, if we move two hundred thousand into the stabilization fund, we might only have a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars we could prepay, depending on the year. Okay, glad you clarified that. Yeah. So I think we want to put this together for you, so you see how the totals add up. Yeah. What I'll do is take. Would this help if we took some of the narrative out and just did the numbers? <laughs> that would yeah. be great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I think the intention was to be more clear with the I narrative, know, but I don't yes. think it worked. It's it's. It's yeah. going to be it's hard a lot of moving watch. pieces. Yeah. And then yeah. it's like the E&D and yeah. the, the circuit yeah. breaker. And like it's much these, easier at CPS when we get to that. Exactly. Later that, it is kind of, it's, it's super yeah, complex. I'm not, I'm not uh, saying that it wasn't. Yeah. I just, I, it, it's like. Appropriation accounts, revolving yeah. accounts, multiple years. So we're going to take the total and just start subtracting off. We'll do the givens first and then show you where the choices are. Okay. And I, I, you know, I completely appreciate it. And I just, I just. Uh, I just have, I have a hard, hard time yep, following no, and I, fair enough. I did look at it. So we'll move that vote to the June 14th yep. um, agenda. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Perfect. And okay. given the fact that it's the end of the year, Ian may have slight changes. Either. Yeah, 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 true. Every day makes a little bit yeah. of a difference. Mm -hmm. And the numbers might look different. You know that business manager we're missing. <laughs> <laughs> I completely, yeah. No, I just, he did a great job, and I'm that. trying to translate. And so, yes, we're going to be glad to see Bob in a few weeks. You see him next time, right? Yeah, yeah he'll be visiting with us next week. So. Okay. Yes, but not participating. Well, no. well, well I'll warn him. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. No, Ian is still on deck next week. Ian's still on deck. Yeah, we'll keep him in the loop. Thank you, Ian. I Thank you. That. Thank you, Ian. All right. Much. So that's a good way to look we'll okay. it up and we'll do it next week. Great. Okay, great. Perfect. COVID update. Everyone's favorite. Yeah, I'll make the COVID update really quick. The great news is the numbers are drop, like really dropping. So uh, last week we went from 157 the week before to 81. The high school went from 104 to 37. So that was really important. And this week's a, a much slower pace at about 25. Uh, a few good pieces of information. We are winding down pool testing this week and that will be it, I think. Never mm -hmm. say never. Um, <laughs> and next year we'll go to symptomatic testing um, and hopefully we're gonna see normal. Great. Yeah, we'll maintain the antigens here so that a student, we're pretty much doing that now. Mm -hmm. We evolve on our own that if somebody's symptomatic, the nurses are testing them right on mm -hmm. the spot. So mm -hmm. that will continue and we'll fund those ourselves and they're off the state bid list. So that's easy. Right. Yeah. Do parents opt into that or is that something that is 
organic with a phone call, your yeah, kid has a fever, shall I test them? It yeah. started as you had to opt in and we really stuck to the consent and then we evolved into let's make the phone call okay. and get yeah. permission. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it won't be an Aspen permission probably. Like I don't time think so. Yeah. No, I think it'll be the, I your child here doesn't okay. feel well. Okay. Great. And it pretty much be automatic. I would, would think that we make test, that call yeah. and ask for the test. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay, at this point, we are on to our additional public comment. So um, I would remind anyone in the audience or online, if you have public comment, please use the raise hand feature or come to the microphone. And I do not see any, so thank you very much. And now we're on to our action items. It's very exciting. So uh, Dr. Hunter, would you like to do the vote to approve the, why don't you just give us that we sure, all have just a quick yeah. we all summary. have this uh, link to the staff request. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the exciting part of this is that this is a new newly hired teacher who's really excited right. to bring her kids with her. So she has a ninth grader and a sixth grader. Great. If someone has that up, um, if you could leave a motion. Yeah, I'll be happy to. Uh, I move that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committees vote to approve the following staff request to enroll her children in the Concord Public Schools, Concord Carlisle Regional School District for the 2022-2023 school year, and the tuition be waived. Nuna Pinto, teacher at CCHS, daughter to enroll in ninth grade at CCHS, and son to enroll in sixth grade at CMS. Second. Discussion? I would note for our new members that this is a one-year commitment, but it's actually a for the duration commitment mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. on the assumption that we can manage it within our, our ratios in mm -hmm. our classrooms. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That passes. Um, up next is a vote to approve the Medco School Committee representative policy. So I would entertain a motion to approve the Metco representative policy as it was uh, seen tonight and it is linked to the agenda. So moved. Okay. Well, we're very excited about this and I think that um, this was really great policy committee and school committee work that we did to move this as quickly as we possibly could. Um, Cynthia. What policy is it going to be? B E D F G. We have. Um, <laughs> we actually have that because cool. Dorothy okay. helped us with that. I think. Oh no, Dorothy will help us with that. Okay. I, I, it is not on that document, but I think we do have that. We will get our, a designation. We did. There was. We did. One. There, there was, was one. It's yeah. not on this document, so we okay. will get the appropriate designation from the MASC. And what they realized. So. I, I had looked at some of the other policies and I was just guessing at what it mm -hmm, might be. Mm -hmm. And Dorothy corrected. She's like, oh, we have some correction work to do in other districts. I said, oh, great, we're doing it the right way. Okay. So she has a designation and I'll just, I'll find what that is. And I'll- Great, if you're um, gonna send this out, the I'll official- out. Yep, the official- Birth of the policy. <laughs> just, uh, as a practical matter, what is the next move by school committee to reach out to our METCO community? Do we have that in place? We, we do have that through the superintendent's uh, METCO advisory Council, um, I believe that's going to go through Lori's office to do outreach uh -huh. to the entire um, K through 12, because uh -huh. that is K through 12. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, community. And then the advisory council will work on an election. So that that's their next project, I would say. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And I have one last Friday update this week that I can tell them you've approved it and put, put it back in front of them and then tell them the process is coming. Great. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Great. So we will take that to a vote. So all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Opposed? Nope. So we are happy. We will have two new seats at the table, hopefully in September. The goal is to really get have the election happen. And when school starts, we will have our new members with us, which will be fantastic. All right. Um, we're taking off the prepayment of collaborative tuitions. And now we have a vote to approve the non-union salary increases. And I believe that Carrie has that motion. Nope. I move that the Concord and Concord Carlisle School Committee provide for a cost of living adjustment of 2.75% for all non-union personnel in FY23, as well as for five salary adjustments and four title changes as recommended by the superintendent of schools. Second. 
Any further discussion? No, we're just we're just happy. We're moving right along, and we've got our increases. And well, and and I think because the year the school year is closing out, I think we can extend our appreciation to all of the non-union personnel. Absolutely. Who, uh, labored so magnificently and supported uh, teachers and students throughout the year <laughs> made the year successful so we're, we're grateful to to all of them absolutely great, great. all right so all in favor aye, aye. 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 okay passes all right so i would now entertain a motion through the concord carlisle regional school committee to adjourn so moved that's a, that's a motion i can make <laughs> you can make that <laughs> second Excellent. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you to our Carlisle members. Thank you, Good night, Carlisle. This Thank wasn't you, And if Thank I you, could Sarah. just um, take a five minute break yeah, before we be start great. Concord. Great. So to the public, we'll be back in about five minutes. And if you could mute us all, that would be great. Thank you.
Um, I can sort of, do you want me to start with like my liaison update and then you can get into the more detailed stuff? So we had our meeting finally on June 2nd. Um, and I thought one of the more worthy things to note was the potential for um, an earlier move-in date that was identified um, in February. And initially I think the move-in date was gonna be over April break. Um, there were some changes that, um, that were based around the idea that some of the smaller punch list items um, could be done after the move-in. So that was um, exciting. Um, the project managers, uh, the selection committee also um, hired a commissioning agent. Um, I didn't know what a commissioning agent was before joining this project. So um, I guess in lay person's terms, just for anyone who doesn't know, um, the commissioning agent essentially um, works closely with the contractors to ensure um, that the building construction project sort of meets all the operational requirements. Um, they're there following the project um, the entire way. So um, we did have six, I think, people in the RFP process and they were able to select someone last week. Um, and then uh, we looked at uh, several different areas um, with increased um, detailed renderings, um, the commons, um, the, some of the more common spaces. Actually, we looked at really the whole building actually. Um, and it is really um, encouraging to see the, the fruits, I guess, of the collaborative work that's being done behind the scenes with the educators and um, the teams to really flesh out this vision. Um, you can really see it now. Um, so, Court, you were there for some of it, but not all of it. Is that I, right? I Did you have anything to add? I got off the call when I got to my workplace. I, I was traveling when yeah. I got to my workplace. I dropped yeah. off the call. Yeah, yeah. I, I, th I thought I saw you pop off. The, the, yeah. the other thing that was good news was the commissioning agent came in under budget. Yeah. Surprising in this environment. So good to know. Yeah, I think I would just add, speaking of that, the estimates have gone out. So we're awaiting the next couple of weeks they'll come back they'll reconcile with hill and smma and then they'll bring to the building committee on the 30th a package of what that estimate is we're all obviously anxious given the conditions of inflation rates and things like that to see where that lands um i know they haven't told us exactly how it, they're getting ahead of that but hill and smma are definitely strategizing what could be, you know, an unpredictable re result to the estimate. So I think we're going to all try to not panic about that because the times are so fluid right now. Like you have to factor in what that even means. But so more to come on that. Um, the work behind the scenes that I'm involved in today I was on a call with all the town department heads and they're talking about permitting processes and things that need to get brought to various committees in town. And I can't say enough about the collaborative work that's going on with the town leadership and the design and um, OPM just proactively and constructively. And I don't think we're gonna find a lot of surprises when these permits need to get processed and they're coming at us fairly quickly. Um, and then the final thing I'll mention is that the light board is talking on the solar project tomorrow morning. Um, I was on a big email with a new rendering of the design of that. So I imagine that's part of their discussion, but it looks like that work is moving along as well. Great. Yeah. Exciting to have a new middle school. I was just thinking today about hot days and we don't have hot days this year. I know. I know. Cause they can, well, I asked. Well, we had a couple grader, in May. Can, well, because of you can use fans this year. Yeah. yeah so we've still year, been watching and still grateful the temperature hasn't been too lower. High. Yeah. We're going to get mm -hmm. by without yeah, worrying mm -hmm. about it. Great. Great. All right. All right, to move on to um, the budget, which hopefully, as indicated, is a little bit more straightforward. It is forward. certainly simpler <laughs> at CPS. So the bottom line is there's 239,000 there. Uh, we need money to close out. We're anticipating 89 to 90,000 ish. Um, bottom line, we've had to do some subsidy also for the food service, but we would like to prepay tuitions with really any balance that's left 
So it's probably approximately 100,000. I watched Carlisle come up with great language to say any remaining balance could it get allocated toward the prepay. I think it would be um, the best use of that money and give us more, more to work with in FY23. And I think we'll leave it at that. It is certainly much simpler. Circuit breaker, just to note, we did use a little bit of that this year, um, a portion of it, but we're not concerned that we are short contingency at this point. We feel good about where we are. So yeah. sir, the, uh, the circuit breaker that we used this year was 200,000 that's yes. referenced, yes. Uh, spent in fiscal 22. Yes. Okay. So rather than carrying over the whole amount, we've used 200,000. Thank you. So is it sort of a June 30th you realize where you think you'll be to, to then go ahead and do you have to pay it before July 1st? I guess the, the special ed tuition. We are, Ian, are you still on? We would encumber and then take the final balance and actually make the allocation. Is that right? Yeah, what, what we've already started doing is identifying placements that we would be able to readily get bills for the fall. Gotcha. There yeah, we, go. okay. we, we would immediately move forward on that. So, yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Ian. So again, you can vote that tonight, or you could package it and put it on for next week and vote it then. I think we could vote it tonight. Yeah, yeah, it's much simpler. I think yeah. it's easy. Yeah, I think it's simple. Great. None of things are really going to change dramatically. No, yeah. no, no. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you, everybody. So we're going to. So our the handbooks for K five are attached. As everyone knows, the handbooks. Um, our collaborative effort with um, principals. And, and I think um, actually with Cynthia and I were chatting maybe today um, or emailing today about the fact that they're they're done collaboratively. Yeah, Kristen actually takes the lead among yep. the three schools and then works with the principals. So she and can yeah, go through the list. Yeah. If you I'll awesome. speak to right. the changes. There's seven changes. None of them are major. They're all minor. Mm -hmm. um, so we changed the dates of the school year, the school committee members, the time of the school release uh, Wednesdays and the update on lunches that there's no lunch provided on Wednesdays. <laughs> um, and uh, we changed our company for uh, who trains us for doing student restraints if those are uh, needed. Uh, we also changed our counseling resource from interface to care solace. And the last change is that we changed, we took off the signature line from the acceptable use computer policy because we don't do it on paper anymore. We do it through the board. <laughs> Those are your changes. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Good. Yeah. So I would entertain a motion to vote to approve the handbooks unless there's any questions for Kristen. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the K-5 school handbooks for 22-23. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, and now we can um, move on to our vote to approve the prepayment of the collaborative tuitions that we just discussed. Anyone want to make that motion? Okay. Uh, I recommend you like to read the MGL. Uh, <laughs> I recommend the Concord School Committee authorize the prepayment of FY 2023 tuitions in accordance with MGL chapter 71, section 71D, and MGL chapter 40, section 4E. Second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Um, so we've concluded our business, guys, and I will take a motion to adjourn. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Thanks everyone and have a good night. Thank you, you too. Thank, Thank you. you. I so lost that.